Good morning. How's everybody doing? Let's open our Bibles to 1 Peter 3. Godly living. Amen. 1 Peter 3. Boy, I tell you, when I was unmarried and this was driven in, into me. <clears throat> in the same way you wives be submissive to your own husbands. Subordinate not as inferior, but out of respect for the responsibilities entrusted to husbands and their accountability to God. And so partnering with them, so that even if some do not obey the word of God, they may be won over to Christ without discussion by the godly lives of their wives. When they see your modest and respectful behavior together with your devotion and appreciation, love your husband, encourage him, and enjoy him as a blessing from God. Your adornment must not be merely external with the interweaving and elaborate knotting of the hair and wearing gold jewelry or being superficially preoccupied with dressing in an expensive clothes. But let it be the inner beauty of the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable quality and an unfading charm of a gentle and peaceful spirit, one that is calm and self-controlled not over anxious, but serene and spiritually mature, which is very precious in the sight of God. For in this way, the former times, the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves being submissive to their own husbands and adapting themselves to them. Just as Sarah obeyed Abraham following him and having regard for him as the head of their house, calling him Lord. And you have become her daughters if you do what is right without being frightened by any fear, that is being respectful toward your husband, but not giving in to intimidation, nor allowing yourself to be led into sin, nor to be harmed. In the same way, you husbands live with your wives in an understanding way, with great gentleness and tact, and with an intelligent regard for the marriage relationship, as with someone physically weaker since she is a woman. Show her honor and respect as a fellow heir of the grace of life so that your prayers will not be hindered or ineffective. Finally, all of you be like-minded, united in spirit, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, courteous, and compassionate toward each other as members of one household and humble in spirit. And never return evil for evil or insult for insult. Avoid scolding, berating, and any kind of abuse. But on the contrary, give a blessing. Pray for one another's well-being and contentment and protection. For you have been called for this very purpose, that you might inherit a blessing from God that brings well-being, happiness, and protection. For the one who wants to enjoy life and see good days, good whether apparent or not, must keep his tongue free from evil and his lips from speaking guile, treachery, or deceit. He must turn away from wickedness and do what is right. He must search for peace with God and with self and with others and pursue it eagerly, actively, not merely desiring it. For the eyes of the Lord are looking favorably upon the righteous, the upright, and his ears are attentive to their prayer, eager to answer. But the face of the Lord is against those who practice evil. Now, who is there to hurt you if you become enthusiastic for what is good? But even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, though it is not certain that you will, you are still blessed, happy to be admired and favored by God. Do not be afraid of their intimidating threats, nor be troubled or disturbed by the opposition. But in your heart, set Christ apart as holy, acknowledging him, giving him first place in your lives as Lord. Always be ready to give a logical defense to anyone who asks you to account for the hope and the confident assurance elicited by faith that is within you, yet do it with gentleness and respect, and see to it that your conscience is entirely clear, so that every time you are slandered or falsely accused, those who attack you or disparage your good behavior in Christ will be ashamed by their own words, for it is better that you suffer unjustly for doing what is right, if that should be God's will, than to be suffered justly for doing wrong. 
For indeed, Christ died for sins once and for all, the just and righteous for the unjust and unrighteousness, the innocent for the guilty, so that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he also went and preached to the spirits now in prison, once who once were disobedient when the great patience of God was waiting in the days of Noah during the building of the ark, in which a few, that is eight persons, Noah's family, were brought safely through the water. Corresponding to that, rescue the flood. <clears throat> Excuse me. Baptism, which is an expression of a believer's new life in Christ, now saves you, not by removing dirt from the body, but by an appeal to God for a good, clear conscience, demonstrating what you believe to be yours through the resurrection of Jesus Christ who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, that is the place of honor and authority with all angels and authorities and powers made subservient to him. Thank you, Lord. Father God, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we thank you for this day, Lord. We glory in you and you alone. We thank you for the Holy Spirit today, Lord God, who rules and reigns in our hearts. And Lord, we invoke your presence here. We invoke the presence of the Holy Ghost. And right now, Lord God, we put on the whole armor of God. Lord, the helmet of salvation, our breastplate of righteousness, our loins guard about with truth, our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, the sword of the spirit and the shield of faith that quenches every dart of every wicked one. And Father, we thank you for making us believers today, Lord God. Lord, it wouldn't be so, Lord God. We wouldn't be standing here if we didn't believe, Lord God. But we believe you, Lord God, to the dying of this flesh, Lord God, and being resurrected through the power of Jesus Christ. And Father, we thank you right now for your goodness and your mercy. We thank you, Lord God, for your loving kindness. We thank you, Lord God, that you've taken the time to teach us and to prepare us, Lord God, and to let us know that, yes, we are in a battle. And no, we're never to give up because you already fought the battle, Lord God, yes. over 2,000 years ago on Calvary. Yes. And it is finished, Lord God. Yes. You called us to finish up, Lord God. You called us into these last days, Lord, to destroy the very essence of Satan everywhere he is in our midst, Lord God. We will not shrink back. We will not stutter. We will not compromise, Lord God. We'll call it like you say call it, Lord God. And we'll live in accordance to your will, Father God. We thank you for the word of God that washes, cleans, and heals, and set free and deliver, Lord God. We thank you, Lord God, for your loving kindness that you've shown each and every one of us, Lord God, every day, Lord God. You don't have to do what you do for us, but you've chosen to, Lord God. You made a way out of no way, Lord God. Father, we thank you, Lord God, that you brought forth your son Jesus, the second Adam, Lord God, to make the way clean and pure and righteous again, Lord God. You made a way that his blood can cleanse us, Lord, from all unrighteousness, Lord. You don't leave out one thing. And Lord, we thank you for cleaning us up from that sodomite nature. Give us a heart to believe unto righteousness and to do your will, Lord God. And not to get sidetracked, Lord God, ever again. But we're in a battle, Lord God, and we're going to win this war because you said that we have. And Lord, we thank you for it today, Lord. We bind every principality, every power, every rule of darkness, every spiritual wickedness in the mighty name of Jesus. All spirits of Ahab, Lord, all spirits of Jezebel, Lord God, every unclean witchcraft working devil, every spirit that has come, Lord God, to traffic and to cause discord among the brethren, we bind you in the name of Jesus. And Lord, we thank you for your power of the Holy Ghost today, Lord. We thank you, Lord God, that you've given it to us, Lord. You've given us our weapons, Lord God, of our warfare, not carnal, but they're mighty through the pulling down of strongholds, Lord, and casting down every imagination, Lord God, everything that tries to exalt itself against you, Lord God. And, Father, we thank you today that we know who we are, Lord God, in you, Father. You said great is he that is in us than he that is in this world. And there's nothing that we cannot do, Lord God, without you, Father. And we thank you, Lord God. And we'll pray and we'll fast and we'll believe you, Lord God. We'll cast down every imagination, Lord Jesus. And we 
In other words, persevering, Lord God. Lord God, yes, we will go through things, Lord God, but that's a good thing because you're working the peaceable fruit of righteousness in us. And Lord God, we thank you, Father God. We thank you for every battle, Lord, for every trial, for every tribulation, Lord God. As long as we've been made into your image, Lord, we thank you for it. And we praise you today, Lord God. We won't give up, Lord God. Prepare your women, Lord God, to be battle axes and your mighty weapons of war, Father. And we thank you for it right now, Lord. We thank you for these brothers, Lord God. Do a work, Lord. Do a work. Do a work, Lord God, down in them, Lord. As they call on you by the morning, noon, and night, Lord God. Answer the prayers of the righteous, Lord. For they avail it much, Lord God. We thank you, Jesus, for the covenant, Lord God. For making us heirs of salvation, Lord God. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Lord. Move in this place, Lord, like you never have before. People didn't come here for nothing, Lord God. You said you're faithful to complete the good work that you've begun in us, Lord. And Father God, we thank you for it today. Do it, Lord. We surrender to you right now, Lord. We lift up holy hands to you, Lord. And we surrender to you, Lord. Do with us as with us as you will, Lord God. Lord God, you're the part of we're the claim. Lord, we don't ask you or tell you what to do, Lord God. But we obey you and we yield to your spirit right now, Lord. We ask that you have your way in this place. Anoint every person, Lord God, under the sound of my voice, Lord God, to receive you today, Lord God. And Father, we praise you for it. We praise you, Lord. We praise you, Jesus. For you are the Holy One, Lord God. We worship you, Lord. There's none like you, Jesus. We lift up our hearts to you, Father. We thank you for the Holy Spirit. Baptize those, Lord God, that's been crying out to you, Lord God. Baptize them and fill them, Lord God, with the Holy Ghost, with the evidence of speaking in tongues and all the gifts of the Spirit, Lord God, and all the fruit, Lord God. Just give them a bountiful blessing today, Lord God. In the mighty name of Jesus, we need it, Lord. We need it. We need to know your voice. We need to hear it, Lord God. We need to have you, Lord God, come and abide and rest and rule and reign in our hearts today, Lord God. We give you everything, Lord. We give you everything, Lord. Everything, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. In the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, root out, root out, Lord God. Destroy, Lord God, everywhere the devil lives in our souls. And we give you everything today, Jesus. We give you everything, Lord God, because we need to, Lord. We need you, Jesus. And as you set us free, Lord God, we go and set your people free. Wherever we are, Lord God. Teach us, Lord God, our hands to war, Lord God, and not to be afraid of any circumstance, Lord God. We praise you today, Lord God, for you alone are worthy, Lord God. And we exalt you, Lord God, in the mighty name of Jesus. And we lift you up, Lord. We lift you up. We lift you up, Lord God, we lift you up in the mighty name of Jesus. We lift you up, Lord. We lift you up, Lord. We lift you up. We lift you up, Lord. And we praise you, Lord. We praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Do it, Lord. Do it, Jesus. According to your will, let it be done in us, Lord, and through us, Father. We thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let us praise and worship the Lord this morning. For the Lord is good. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Elijah ran to the cleft of the rock. It didn't come in the wind. (laughs) It didn't come, Lord God. You sent a small, still voice. Then you sent your man of God, Jehu. And he trampled that thing underfoot. But Lord God, we thank you for the rain today. We thank you, Jesus, because of who you are, Lord Jesus. There's none like you, Lord. We don't want nothing that look like Jezebel in us or around us. It will not be tolerated, Lord. We're done. We're done. Because we need your rain. We need it to flow, Lord God. 
We need it, Lord God, to take up these souls, Lord God. They need you, Lord Jesus. And we need your power. And we ask that, Lord God, you cleanse us and cleanse us and cleanse us and cleanse us, Lord Jesus, to become more like you, Lord. More like you, Jesus. More like you, Lord. We need you, Jesus. We need it. We need it, Lord. And I thank you for my brothers, Lord God. I thank you for them. Protect them in every way. Give them everything they need. If they're lacking in finances, Lord God, give it to them, Lord, so they don't have to think about it. They can put their minds on you, Jesus. Please, Lord. We ask you, Lord God, let it rain today, Lord Jesus. Let it rain. Let peace rule in their homes, Lord Jesus. Oh, God, we thank you today. We thank you, Jesus. Let the Holy Ghost rule and reign, Lord God, in our hearts everywhere we go, Father. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for the anointing of the Holy Ghost, Lord Jesus. In this place, you met us here, Lord God, because we came expecting you, Lord. We came expecting you, Lord, to do great and mighty things, Lord Jesus. And you showed up again, Lord. And we thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We bless your holy name. And Lord God, we lift you up today, Lord Jesus. We thank you, Lord God, for the household of faith. We thank you, Lord God, for a pure church. We thank you, Lord God, without spot or blemish, Lord God. We thank you for it today, Jesus. We thank you, Lord God. That's what we want. That's what we desire. Nothing but you, Lord God. Nothing but you, Lord God. Everywhere, Lord God, there's something hiding out in us, Lord. Uncover it because we don't want nothing but you, Jesus. We want you, Lord God. We want you, Lord. We want you, Jesus. We want you, Jesus. And we lift you up today, Lord God. We praise you, Lord God. There's nothing like you, Lord God. There's no one, Lord God, that can fulfill us, Lord Jesus. You created us, Lord God. You put that light on us, Lord God. You did, Lord Jesus. And we thank you for it, Lord. We thank you, Lord God. Oh, I thank you, Jesus. I thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We thank you for your word, Lord God. We thank you, Jesus. I don't care what nobody say. I thank you, Holy Ghost. I thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. We can't live without you. We cannot, and we thank you, Lord. We praise you, Jesus. Let the redeemed of the Lord say, amen. amen. Give somebody a hug in here today. God is good. Amen. Amen. He never fails us. Thank you, Jesus. Right, how's everybody doing today? Good, good. All the guys in town for the man up meeting. These are the last, this is the last day, last service. Hopefully everybody had a good weekend. Got some things accomplished, talked about some good, fruitful things, and hopefully everybody can go back home recharged and ready to go. Because the devil is not going away. So you got to have energy and force to confront him, and hopefully we help charge batteries to give you the intestinal fortitude to keep on pushing. All right, remember after these announcements, we're going to take the group picture, so we're going to do that first in case somebody got an early flight. We can uh, get the uh, man up group picture done, and we're going to invite the ladies to take another picture with us also so we can get a whole corporate picture done also if we got enough room. We'll, we'll make it work some kind of a way. But uh, let's do the announcements first. First announcement, of course, reading material. We always tell you about books to read. The first book here, important book, Soul Ties. Soul Ties. A lot of times you try to run 30 feet, and you find out that that cord snatches your neck back. Because it's a 29-foot cord, because you got a soul tie. You attach to something, somebody, somewhere, it won't let you go any further. It's a soul tie. You know, your mind can only extend just so far if you got a soul tie, because you're limited by the thinking processes and the mental makeup of somebody else you join yourself to. This is real. You can be knit together with somebody through covenant activity, time spent with them, and the most forceful one is, of course, what? Sexual soul ties. A sexual soul tie can plague you for decades. And you'll be looking around trying to figure out what's wrong with you. But back in the 12th grade, with somebody you joined yourself to that had a strong mojo on them, 
bathed and dipped in witchcraft, who is forecasting devices against your soul, they knit themselves into your personality and into your mind, and it bound your soul to them. So their failures, their perceptions, their attitudes, their emotional makeup, the limitations on their minds transferred to your mind, and you see life from a particular perspective because you got a soul tie. You want God to break all inordinate soul ties and then establish righteous soul ties. Soul ties can be good or evil. David and Jonathan had a righteous soul tie. The Bible says that their souls were knit together in love. And what knits you together in a righteous soul tie is based on selflessness. You're not selfish any longer. You and another person have a selfless relationship, and that's a righteous soul tie. So you got to understand these things. Spiritual forces are real. You know, you, it'll cause you a lot of heartache and headaches and a lot of time just wandering around in the wilderness in your mind trying to figure out what's wrong, wrong with you. If you've had multiple sexual partners, you got a hodgepodge of confusion and a lot of different soul ties because you've knit yourself to a lot of different souls. But Jesus Christ and the blood of Jesus is able to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But you got to come how? Correct. You got to come right. You can't fool around with this and pretend like it's not what it is. You got to come straight and narrow and let the Lord know, I did this. I brought this on myself. And I'm asking you, God, through your mercy and grace to expunge all these inordinate affections out of my soul. And uh, you got to enumerate a lot of times where the soul ties are. Don't walk around ashamed and burdened down with your head cast down. Just do what you got to do to get free. Nobody pays the penalty for sin but the sinner. You know, it's real. Somebody was talking about yesterday that, you know, all sin was accompanied by some type of a musical element. What was that? What was that? He said sin has a what? Yeah, sin has a soundtrack. We had a lot of good sound bites to come out of the man up meeting. <laughs> Sin has a soundtrack. So you had a soundtrack that accompanied your sin. So when you hear that music, that soul tie with that particular sinner is now rebirthed. And sin has a soundtrack that replays in your mind. Because when you was in there grooving, you had a soundtrack playing in the background. And when that old Sade music starts up, you remember Runny from the first grade or whatever. You was in the first grade doing this stuff. You were really messed up. <laughs> But I'm just saying, it's stuff that can do what? Initiate a spirit in you that is called memory recall. There's a demon spirit called memory recall. You're driving down the street and all of a sudden you start thinking about stuff that's nowhere near your mind. That's a demon of memory recall. He's calling up something to try to condemn you, castigate you, put you down, make you ashamed, so that when you pray, those memory recalled spirits initiate. You ever tried to pray and your mind just go into chaos? That's a devil just saying, you're not worthy to how dare you approach a holy God with your dirty mind, your dirty dog, you know. They'll curse in your mind. They'll bring filthy images. They'll give you filthy dreams so that when you kneel to pray, you feel unworthy. It's just a, man, this is a warfare. It's a warfare. And the devil hates expository teaching because it exposes what he's doing. Soul ties. Break them. Get away from them. Expunge every evil, inordinate tie to whoever you tied yourself to and walk away free. Soul Ties by Frank Hammond. You can get it on Amazon.com. Soul Ties. Man, it's a good book. Get it. It'll help you. The Organic Gospel is the other book written by myself and Maisha Hunter. I think the hidden revelation in this world right now amongst church people is the fact that the gospel is organic. It's alive. Jesus said, my words are spirit and they are life. Embedded seed. A seed dies, breaks open, the DNA in the seed begins to migrate and replicate itself. You know, cellular structure replicates itself. That's how your skin repairs itself. You got cellular rep or replication going on, a reproduction from DNA in your skin. So if you cut it, then your skin begins to repair itself through cellular replication. So if you plant Jesus in you, that seed form of the word drops into you, it cracks open, and out of that seed, comes the DNA of Christ, and he begins to expand his borders. If he hits against something that's not like himself, 
he'll begin to deal with the barrier that's, re that's preventing his expansion of his kingdom. Remember, the kingdom is an ever-increasing kingdom. It expands its borders, and the kingdom does not come with observation for where is the kingdom at? So it's growing. It's a growing kingdom in you, and once the kingdom expands into every cellular structure that God has ordained to be in the kingdom, and he's brought everybody into an organic relationship with Jesus through that expansion of the kingdom, he'll come for those who bear the image of the kingdom. And you can't stop him. When he knows he's through and everybody's in, he's coming. That's why he says, man, like a thief in the night, he comes because his kingdom came. So he says, we pray that his kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. The kingdom is, is within you. So the expansion of the kingdom through organic replication, the DNA and cellular structure of a seed planet begins to expand in you until his kingdom comes. So what happens is, as you get more and more conscious of the kingdom and you let that expansion take place, every external thing begins to grow dim. Things you don't even care about anymore. You just lose any kind of concern for it, any recognition of it. You don't think about it. So everybody outside the kingdom, they are concerned about out-of-court activity. Then they may grow a little bit, bit and they become soulish people who are inner-court people who are concerned about themselves. You talk to them and all they have is a self-awareness. Everything is personal. Everything's about me. The kingdom hasn't come yet. When you lose consciousness of self and the kingdom comes, you don't think about yourself or out-of-court activity because the kingdom has come and you're doing the will of God. Intrusion into the kingdom by a foreign element, you immediately, immediately see that as some type of an organism that's contaminating the kingdom, and you expel it from your system. You got built-in antibodies that will cast out anything that is not kingdom. It's about the kingdom. If this is a lesson, man, you can't teach. It's got to happen to you. You are right now sitting here wherever you are in the process. You're either not saved outside of the kingdom totally, and everything I'm saying is foreign. You came to Jesus, but you're still a worldly person and you're earthly. That means you're in the outer court of the kingdom. Everything is basically foreign. You might have stepped into the inner court. You became sensual. You see how the progression is? Earthly, sensual, demonic, moving away from the kingdom. But when you're coming in, you start out earthly. You come in, become sensual. And then you finally become spiritual coming in. If you go out, you'll become earthly, sensual, and demonic because you invited a spirit. It's all about what spirit you're of. Jesus said these people are around and you know not what spirit you're of. We're talking to the, a disciple that was going off the deep end. It's a spiritual presence. We're going to show you how this works today as we unfold today's message. The organic gospel, it ain't about a bunch of trying. It's not about a bunch of trying to find out a bunch of information. It's not about you and I trying to assess a lot of data and having a lot of information from different sources that we just regurgitating all over people. Nobody wants to be puked on. So if you got a bunch of data stored and you just puking up data all day, you become distasteful. It was a guy over at the hotel in town for the LSU beatdown of Oklahoma last night, on Saturday night, <laughs> What's last, yeah, last night, yesterday, yesterday afternoon. 66 to 28 or something like that. You know what I'm saying? Like a high school team playing a, a NFL team. But he was at the bar. He was an LSU fan. So I, I had my Georgia cap on. The LSU beat down Georgia a couple of weeks ago. So I went up to that couple, him and his wife, in their 50s, and I just started weeping. I said, every time I see you guys, I begin to weep. <laughs> you know, I'm weeping, you know. And he was saying, man, what you got that mess on your head for? I said, you know, man, it is what it is. We got beat down. Y'all going to probably beat down these boys tonight, too. It's the way it is, you know. But see, a person full of data and religious talk, you know what they would approach the guy with? Do you know the Lord? <laughs> Are you saved? See, you don't, have, you don't have any sense. You don't get, you don't get it yet. You meet a person where they are. If they're an LSU fan, and that's the common denominator to approach him at, start talking about some football. And finally, the guy will ask, what are you guys here for? That's where you're in. Yes, oh, we have a man up meeting that we're dealing with guys coming together on one accord to present Christ to the nations, and we're here to, you know, get together and naturally build each other up in fellowship in preparation for the outpouring of the Holy Ghost to 
see the Lord come back and just set everything right. He let you in because he wondered what are all these guys doing here. But when you come in in a religious mindset, you start puking up a bunch of data. You need to go back to the phase one, go back to kindergarten, and find out what it really is like to represent Christ so you can become all things to all men and save people. You've got to be able to be used by God for real in real time, dealing with lives led by the Holy Ghost, knowing where you are at that particular time, what you're dealing with, and God fabricating you the approach to save a soul. If they're the enemy of all righteousness, then they're going to hate your guts by nature. and nothing you can do. They're going to be against whatever's coming their way. And even a friendly chat, they won't like you because the spirit in them won't like you. So you got to just adapt to situations. Nothing is personal. Everything is what it is. You get the whole world, he says, to get out of treasure. He saved the whole world 2,000 years ago, but he only gets out a remnant. And Jesus knows that. He knows everybody that's going to be saved right now. But we don't, he won't tell us, though, because you know what we do. Oh, they damn, don't, don't even talk, they damn. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So he keeps us developing through interactions with people because he don't let, not only has to save them, he has to keep us saved. And the way to keep us saved is to keep us blinded to some things so we'll be dependent on him. When we become independent of him, we're in a tragic state. You know, it's bad to be sitting around thinking about yourself all day. And your meditations are all about you. You're a pitiful soul. What somebody said to me, did to me, me, my eye is my whole world. Man, you're talking about a sad soul. You need to get your mind above. He said to set your affections in the Bible, which is your mind above, not on things in the earth. And buddy, don't let anybody intrude into that part of you that's set above to bring you back down. Did you not know everybody chirping at you and sniping at you is trying to get you into their world and their arena? They want you to respond in the flesh in their arena. That's why you ignore them and save as many as you can. If you're about the Father's business of saving souls, the Holy Spirit will rest on you because you're about the will of God and saving souls. That's what God's about right now. He's not about all this other stuff. I don't care what the New World Order is doing and what uh, you know, all these different coots and wackos are doing. We need to be full of the Holy Ghost to be a witness to a dying world. That's all that matters. The organic gospel teaches this, shows you what it's about. It refabricates your thinking processes to think outside of the status quo of religion and get out of yourself to become a vessel fit for the master to use. Get a copy of it at www.theorganicgospel.net. www.theorganicgospel.net. Next thing, remember, next up, starting this week, we'll post the information for the Women's Fellowship, March 13th, 13th through 15th here again in Atlanta. You know, guys go first in December, then we deal with women being made ready to stand with the guys. Whenever you see anybody trying to separate men from women, that's the devil. You, we got to have cooperation. We got to have unity. We got to have coordination and amalgamation of men with the women to get the body of Christ. You're not going to get the full statue of God and the revelation of Jesus Christ with women and men separated. That's not the totality of the body because uh, Adam's missing a rib. You don't have a total Adam with a missing rib. You've got to have that rib joined back to Adam to have all of Adam to process what God is about to do. So we're not against women. We're not misogynists. A lot of people say we're misogynists. You know that? We're against women, and we're trying to pull them down. I tell them, I can't help it if your husband is crazy and beating you down at the house because he thinks we're about being uh, against women. That's your husband's inner problem. you got a problem. He's a psychotic whatever. But we're about him coming home as a selfless servant to nourish the, the wife, to build her up, to edify her, to make her fruitful. You know, no farmer goes out and poisons his field. If that's the seed he's going to plant the, plant the seed in, that's the field he's going to put the seed in, why would he poison his crop by poisoning the field? Women are a field. Guys are seed bearers. So you tend to the seed, the, the, the place the seed is going to be planted. The Bible says you nourish it and cherish it, cherish it as Christ does the church. 
How does he do that? With his words. You speak edification, exhortation, and confidence to their spirits and their souls to build them up and nourish them in the inner man so they'll be a fruitful field. See, this thing, man, you got to understand how it all works and how it all goes together. A Jezebel spirit don't want to be a fruitful field. What does it want to be? A seed bearer. All the Jezebel spirit wants to be is a guy. That's all it is. It contends with a man because it wants to be a man. So it incorporates a feminine guy into the equation to be a wife to it. If you can get this man, you way down the road in understanding the gospel. So what is, that's, the, that's the tension you feel down here. Some, somebody that's feminine, a woman, trying to be a seed bearer with a man trying to have eggs and ovaries. That don't work. You get transgenders and all kinds of perversions out of that. If you expose that, then immediately you become an enemy of everybody that's in that spirit. You've got to become their enemy because you've exposed what they're doing and they don't like it. Then that's when you become a false prophet. But it's all about expos expository teaching that exposes what the devil is doing. That's what you got to do to keep the church on track. So remember now the women, March 13th through the 15th here in Atlanta again. Again, that same red and gold button would be at the top right-hand corner of our web page, omegaministries.org. Click on that registration button. It will walk you through the registration process and take you to where you got a call to reserve your hotel rooms. Hotel rooms are normally $100 a day, double occupancy. So you're talking about two queen-size beds, double occupancy, which is $50 a night per person for two nights, $100. So, you know, and the registration is 135 to cover all the food for, for two or three days. That's what it's all about. It's, it's relieving you of all the stuff you got to do, this extracurricular, to be able to concentrate on what we're doing. We went to the hotel over here. We had to move the Saturday meeting over to the Crown Royal, which was a nice hotel still because that hotel we were in, it had a fire. So the fifth and sixth floors were, are being radically renovated. So... They moved us over there, but they set it all up so that everything transferred over there. And we just keep on going. I've learned whatever situation you're in, just adapt quickly and do what you got to do. Somebody panicking and yelling and shouting and running, man, you need to calm down. That was the other thing. I think Brother Huff was talking about being a Marine and how the Marines teach you there are four coded colors that you have to be conscious of when you're in a combat arena. Ranging from what from from white to yellow to red to black at white You're in a calm basically, you know passive environment in black Everything you're under heavy fire and artillery is coming in and they teach them to stay somewhere around what yellow you said Kind of aware of your environment, but never panicking because you'll become Dysfunctional if you get too hyped up and get full of too much adrenaline and get too excited, you're going to forget something to become dysfunctional. you there with a machine gun pulling the trigger. I forgot the bullet. You know, <laughs> see, all, see, amen, <laughs> amen. See, the devil does things quickly. If you're dysfunctional and excitable, you're going to overreact to him. God wants you to stay moderate, stay under the auspices of the Holy Ghost, and respond accordingly without a bunch of hype in you. It, nothing is that big, big of a deal. Here's how you can monitor yourself to keep yourself on track. This is a simple thing I always do. Anything brought to me, if it won't matter tomorrow morning, I dare to dump it. See, if you tell me something that I, don't, I won't care about tomorrow, then it's insignificant. And I can't think of one thing that's going to matter tomorrow morning. You know why? Because I'll be dead. It's impossible for it to matter. Anything somebody talks about is insignificant because they're going to die. So when you in that grave pushing up those lilies, whatever you just talked about, I guarantee you, you won't care. So what are we doing? We're walking around responding to what? Shadows, smoke, nuances that are not real. It don't matter. But see, you're, that can't, that's not theory. That's got to happen to you. God has got to refabricate your inner man until it happens to you and you lose all of it. 
Most folk have vignettes and vestiges of all this stuff in them, and they're still responding, thinking it's God moving. No, man, just data dump it. It don't matter. What difference does it make? I'll show you how Jesus responded to stuff. You can see it all through Jesus' life. He never responded. You know, what's the wheat? What's the chaff to the wheat? Jesus, so-and-so is a man of the dead, buried the dead. <laughs> he didn't care. He didn't care. Because he knew, come next Wednesday, it won't matter. You ever seen somebody that you were around that died soon after you were around them? Whatever you talk to them about, that day that they died, it matters. It matters not at all to them. It's, they're gone. So, you know, you, you, when you see a lot of people die, I've seen a lot of people die in my life. And when you're looking at a dead person's face, you realize it ain't much to this. So all the hype, all the angst, all the anger, all the arguments, and then somebody dies. That's like if I, if I, if I hate Sal. In my life, it's been hating Sal, and Sal dies. Now what did I do with my hatred? Put it on the weekend. <laughs> Start hating your son. <laughs> what well, he looks like him. Yeah, you, you ain't your Sal, son. No, go on, and I hate you now. It's crazy. You see how stupid it is? I'm venting on a person. I hate their guts. They die. Now what did I do with my hatred for them? I, I, now I'm a depositor of all this hatred and bitterness, and I got nobody to vent it on. You see how useless it is? It's crazy. Never idolize a person negatively or positively so you'll keep your mind free. All the women get ready. Women usually come in stronger. We had about 40 guys this time, a little over 40 guys. Women usually come in 70 or 80 strong. So get in early. Reserve your spots because we put limited rooms on hold because the hotel won't give us the whole hotel. You know what I'm saying? So we got to reserve maybe 20 rooms. That's 40 people. But if it, as it goes up, it, they can adapt to it, you know what I'm saying? But if we, if we reserve too high and it comes in too low, you got to have, you, whatever number you give them is an 80% fulfillment rate. So if I gave them, let's say theoretically, 50 rooms, you got to fill 40 of them. So we can't go high. We got to wait for the people to come in and backfill and they go over the number and they're good because you didn't tell them too many rooms. See, all this is... All this is what you got to deal with when you're making deals and dealing with people and certain numbers will allow you to get a conference room for free or something like that. You got to be able to go out there and wheel and deal with people to get stuff done. And, you know, you're outside the scope of knowing how things work. You're sitting around, you just, well, I'll just wait to the last minute. So you might be left out. You might have to stay across the street somewhere because the deals have to be made to accommodate pricing, uh, and, and res reservations for conference rooms and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, it's going to be January 1st, what, this Wednesday? Yeah. That means March 13th is like three hours after that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm serious, man. It's going to jump from January to March so fast you won't know what happened. February is a short month. This is a leap year, I think. So it's 29 days this year, right? So it's going gonna, it's gonna to leap. From, from January 31st to March 13th, it's going to leap over February. So you got to get your mindset right now. You might as well start packing your stuff now and get a toothbrush and get buy some Listerine and stuff right now and start getting your little bag packed and be ready to go. And then you'll see that the weekend, it just spirals through real fast. You know, we got here Friday, now it's Sunday evening. You're on the jet this evening, jetting back home. You, don't, you won't even know what happened. But hopefully in the meantime, the Holy Ghost could get a hold of you and do some things to you that you're not even conscious of, and it affects your mind. All the targeting is, is for your mind, to change how you think, because as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. If you can change how a person thinks, you can change their destiny. I'm telling you, man, everybody that stalls out, they don't, they don't change how they think, and they go back to where they came from. You watch a person, they never stay the same. If you move from Jesus, you'll begin to degrade and go back to where you came from. You got to stay with him. You got to stay in lockstep with him to make it in. It's important. So all the ladies get ready March 13th through 15th. When that registration comes up, we'll try to get it up. I call Tom today. Tom, he, Tom does stuff real fast. If I call him today, which I will, he'll probably have it up by tomorrow or Tuesday. As soon as you see that red button switch over, 
and you'll see the page say the women's fellowship is up, start registering right now, make plans, call the hotel, it's $50 to reserve your slot. We'll set up the web, a web page for the women uh, to uh, register through the web page, and we'll try to uh, let the hotel know as you call in, make sure you tell them it's for the Omega Ministries Conference because they block the rooms based on the phone call. If you don't tell them that, they'll just give you a regular room rate and possibly give you a king-size bed or something like that. So, you know, listen, listen to what's told to you and just follow the instruction. You know, don't put together a brand new piece of furniture and start drilling holes because something don't fit, you know. Hold it, hold it, hold it. You got 75 holes you're drilling in this thing, trying to make it fit. Did you, did you read the instructions? <laughs> That's what it's all about. You got to follow the instructions. Follow the instructions given to you and everything will be all right. So get ready for that. July, Hammer Beach, Florida. The contract is already signed. It's already reserved. We paid the down payment. Soldiers of Light Conference in Hammock Beach, Florida. Down at uh, Hammock, Hammock Beach Resort down in Palm Coast, Florida. Hammock Beach Resort, Palm Coast, Florida in July. Soldiers of Light again this year. We always try to get together everybody, all the family members, kids and everybody, for the kids to have some fun on the beach, goof off and enjoy a little vacation time. That runs from Thursday through Sunday. And uh, it's going to be in the, I think, the third week of July, I think it is this year. Is that it? I can't, yeah, I think it's the third, huh? Third, 23rd of July? I think it's the third week in July. You know, the dates will be up when we get it. It'll go up. Just it, it'll go up in just a minute. Try to give you about eight to nine months lead time into that. So you're talking about July is what seven months away? Twenty third through twenty six. So we'll put that up immediately too to begin the process of getting ready for that. So you know you got time if you if you are wise when you leave one conference you just make plans and just put a little money away for the next one. It's not, it's not really expensive because we got it set up where you can get in suites and stay with a lot of people in one suite. I mean, you got families that might stay in a three or four bedroom suite and you'll split the cost and it comes out as a nominal cost because it's all split up. So, you know, it's a lot of fun down there, fellowship. You get to know people, get to meet people. You know, you, you know it's nothing better than meeting different people and getting a lot of perspectives, a lot of stories told to you because it adds to your data bank and adds to your life as far as life experiences that may help you. It, it, I mean, it's fruitful to talk to different people and what they're going through. You know, don't be a, a, a sealed up person, man. Ask God to open your life up to be able to expose yourself to other people and interact with people because there's a lot of knowledge. There's a wealth of knowledge down here in interacting with people. Don't be a racist because your knowledge may be increased by somebody of a different race, a different cultural, culture, or a different ethnicity. And if you're a racist, you just cut off a whole area of information and of what could have helped you. Man, you got to get free from everything down here. Get free, man. The, 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 the goal is to get free from everything that binds you. That's what you're trying to do. Next thing, remember, doing the tabernacle, the vision is to create an atmosphere like the one I just described where everybody's free. Free flowing. Nobody looking for you to join anything. If you still operate in joining this or being a member here, we're waiting for you to get free because you still operate in the old church paradigm when you think you're a member of something and we got nothing for you to join. You got to be born into the body of Christ. You can't join it. So when you're born again, it makes no difference where you fellowship because everywhere is a living organism that you belong to. So we're not looking for members. We're looking for a base camp so that everybody that is organically birthed into Christ can operate from a base camp to do the work and will of God. We're just a supply line with Bibles and books and study tools and videos and places to pray and get taught what you need and provide tools for you, study halls for you to come and study in and do your Bible studies, all the commentaries and concordances and all the study materials you need on hand, to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. Get this joining stuff out of you. You got to get it out of you. You got to get that stuff expunged from your soul. Being a member of some type of an organization as opposed to being an organically born member of the body of Christ. 
Christ is not an organization. He's an organized organism. He's alive. It's a living thing. And boy, it takes a long time for a lot of people to drop that. They're still trying to report to somebody and be a member of something. And I'm looking at them like, I don't even know what you're talking about. You know, they'll be amplifying Dunamis Tabernacle. I don't even care about that. I don't even know nothing about no Dunamis Tabernacle. Well, you just said something? I know I did. I don't care about that junk. Because their minds are stuck in concrete. This has got to happen to you to understand this. You can't understand unless it happens to you. When it happens to you, everything I say about it makes sense. If it hasn't happened to you, you're trying to find me to blame me for something that happened to you. If you got Christ as your head and you walk with him, there's nobody that can do anything to you. It's impossible. There is nothing from the outside of a man that can defile a man. Ever defile an element as well. Now, the first thing that came out of you is what, he said? Evil thoughts. You could be sitting right here thinking evil. Inside, you're frowning. Mad, you know. But you're smiling out here, but inside. Now, guess what? Don't nobody care nothing about you. Nobody even think about you. Nobody cares about you. That's liberating to me. You walk through the lobby of the hotel, nobody in the hotel lobby cares anything about you. When you walk through the lobby, not everybody's down there. I wonder who that is. <laughs> nobody cares nothing about you. Get in an Uber. The driver don't care nothing about you. He's going to dump your butt out downtown at a hotel and move on, trying to find another rider. You in the back, uh, he looking at me funny. I wonder what he's thinking about me. Thinking about you going somewhere. It's time, man, to get your mind straight. So that's it, y'all. You know, Dunamis Tabernacle support it, www.omegaministry.org. Click on support, followed by donate. Remember, prayer every Wednesday, all day prayer and fasting, 12 30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Call in for the prayer line. We got enough people, man, around the country, around the world to call in and get this prayer wheel turning. We got to keep the prayer wheel turning. We had intercessory prayer and communion last night with the guys. Man, you got to do some praying, man. You got to do some praying. Because prayer turns the wheel. And God is a, a prayer answerer, answerer. You got to keep on praying. Pray without ceasing. The effectual, fervent prayers of a righteous man availeth much. We get a bunch of righteous guys together, they're effectually and fervently praying. We might not feel like anything happens, but, buddy, it availeth much. You'll see the results later on. So join that prayer line every Wednesday, 12, 30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. That number is 712-770-5603. 712-770-5603. And the access code is 409-367. 409-367. All right, before we get going here today, we're going to take up a quick offering here. And by way of the Internet, do the best you can. We, we invite anybody and everybody to contribute, man, on a, in a faithful fashion. We don't give you amounts to give. There's no $1,000 line or $500 line. And the Lord has spoke to me and said there's eight people with $100. You know, come on, man. Come on. <laughs> Just do what you do faithfully. Do it consistently. So that we can get a pattern established of giving so we'll have something to anchor us to know what's going on. You know, it's always us juggling coins to stay alive until God pours out. You know, a poured out blessing is different from just trying to sustain yourself. You know, in the promised land, there's a land flowing with milk and honey. And there's sustenance that's going to, you know, really be real that you can roll with. Outside of that, you just kind of juggle you know, robbing Peter, and then you're paying Paul over here. See, that's what you do until God moves. And, I, you, know, you know, a great fear, a great fear would be that if the ark launched and I wasn't on it. See, right now, God has a bus parked out front. He's saying, get on the bus. Get on the bus. I'm begging you. I'm pleading with you. Get on the bus. Get on the bus. But when the bus doors close and it drives off, you miss the bus. Everybody can stand outside yelling at you and accusing you and cursing you. But, buddy, 
when the bus takes off and you're not on it, can you imagine the fear that will grip the human soul? When you realize I'm out here sinning and a fool and I missed the whole thing. Noah is an idiot until it starts raining. Boy. Lot is a cursed guy until the fire falls. See, everything looks like it ain't real until that day that God moves. And then as Sapphira, and Sapphira probably told a whole lot of lies. But that one day when the Holy Ghost manifested, that's the day they died. Don't fool around with God because he's an expert at looking like he's not doing anything. And he'll just sit there looking at you. And he said, your own sins are going to find you out. Time and my word will take care of you. He's already proclaimed certain curses over certain spiritual forces. He showed you what he does to a Jezebel spirit. That's eternal. That's eternal judgment. So he'll watch you in that spirit and let you dis destroy yourself because he already trolled over the thing with horses. He galloped over it and already had dogs eat the body of Jezebel in the streets of Jezreel. It already happened. So he just sits and watch, watches that same thing cycle through over and over again. You can deceive your own self to believe that God ain't for real. But God don't respond to folk. His word is settled forever. Every curse and every blessing is already in place. You have to just walk in a righteous or unrighteous state, and the curse or the blessing will come upon you. They'll overtake you, the Bible says. So, man, don't fool around with him because he don't make a lot of noise and do a lot of talking. That's scary about him. So we're going to take up a quick offering here. If you're given by way of the Internet, click over to omegaministry.org, top button, hit support. The drop-down box will say donate. Hit that button. It'll take you through the donate process. Then come back over here to this channel on, on uh, live stream and Facebook live for today's message which is entitled my whore is my holy ghost my whore is my holy ghost before you start yelling at me and screaming at me and cursing me just sit back and listen to the whole thing because you don't know what it's about that's inappropriate you don't even know what it's about yet just wait wait so let's take up a quick offering we'll be right, right back at you in five minutes for today's message, and we appreciate you giving. She said, all the guys, uh, if you would, come up and line up the tallest guys in the back, moving up to the you know, shortest, shorter guys in the front, so we'll get a good shot here. Kind of moving as tight as you can, too, because we got to. Huh?
All right, here we go. All right, let's pray. Here on the Father, we thank you for this time of sharing. Thank you for the word of God. Right now, God, we commit this time to you to understand your word and walk therein. It's time to see the church, God, advance forward, move away from this pitiful, God-forsaken world to be reformed outside of this age in order to put forth an eternal truth to the masses to be saved. God, we've seen that all this effort and all these Religious endeavors have brought nothing to bear fruitfully on our lives. We want to see now Jesus Christ enthroned as God and Lord over all flesh. Your kingdom must come and everything in us must be changed, God, to accommodate your kingdom. God, it's a supernatural work you're doing all by yourself. It's not with human hands. The Bible says nothing done by the flesh profits anything. The flesh profits nothing. It's the spirit that gives life. So right now, God, regenerate, renew. God, come forth with power to destroy the devil's works and to raise up your people to be fruitful people in these last and evil days. Do it for your honor. Do it for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're talking about my whore is my Holy Ghost. My whore is my Holy Ghost. And we're looking at right now what happens to a society that's cursed by whoredoms. Whoredoms is a scourge on society. And when you see whoredoms manifesting, that's a marker that lets you know that men have abdicated their authority. You can turn this down some or take the highs out or something. It's kind of, kind of uh, reverberating or something up here. Men have abdicated their authority, and the world has been sold over to whoredoms who, ref- who are reflectors of men. No matter how you cut the cake, women are the glory of a man. So if you see whoredoms everywhere, you know that the men have become whoremongers. See, they're reflecting what a man wants. So they reflect the fact that men have become unfaithful to God. So it's not an accusation or a condemnation of women. It's an evaluation of the entire landscape, why everything is like it is. And this thing is like a plague on the land. It's It's pandemic. Folks are now losing their minds behind this, and I'm going to show you what happens when a man searches for comfort from whoredoms at the expense of the Holy Ghost. And uh, it's, it's a stark contrast when you realize where these spiritual forces come from. So let's begin by looking at Proverbs chapter 6. Proverbs chapter 6 and chapter 7 detail how these things operate in the world. Proverbs chapter 6 We'll set it up by reading the first part of Proverbs chapter 6, which leads into what I'm talking about today. He says, Proverbs chapter 6, verse 1, My son, if you be surety for thy friend, if you have stricken thy hand with a stranger, you are snared with the words of your mouth. You are taken with the words of your mouth. Do this now, my son, and deliver yourself when you are come into the hand of thy friend, Go humble thyself and make sure thy friend. So it says, if, you, if you're surety, if you kind of uh, become a, a, a person on a loan with somebody and you're a surety for them, then you messed yourself up. You've gotten into a bad situation. You swore allegiance to something, and he says you're taken by the words of your mouth, the fact that you swore to it. He says, do this to deliver yourself when you're coming to the hand of your friend. Go humble yourself and make sure your friend or Pay them whatever you do them and, you know, make it everything, make everything straight so everything goes away. Give not sleep to your sleep to your eyes, nor slumber to your eyelids. Deliver yourself as a roe from the hand of the hunter and as a bird from the hand of the fowler. Go to the ant, you sluggard, you lazy person. Consider her ways and be wise, which have no guide, overseer or ruler. Look at this now. The ant has no guide, no overseer, nor ruler. But the ant provides her meat in the summer and gathers her food in the harvest. How long will you sleep, O sluggard? He's talking to a lazy person. When will you arise out of your sleep? Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. 
So shall your poverty come as one that tra travels, and they and thy want as an armed man. A naughty person, a wicked man, walks with a froward mouth, a perverse mouth. He's always spewing off perversion, always got angst, animosity, vile, and vitriol spewing from their mouths because you're looking at a naughty person. A wicked man has a froward, perverse mouth. He winks with his eyes. He speaks with his, with his feet. He teaches with his fingers. Frowardness or perversion is in his heart. He devises mischief continually. He sows what? Discord. You can always mark a perverse man. He's always trying to start disunity, confusion, and discord. Mark them because that's the moniker and the, and the signpost of a perverse man. Judgment already rests on him. Therefore shall his calamity come, what? Suddenly. Suddenly shall he be broken without remedy. These six things does the Lord hate. Yea, seven are an abomination unto him. A proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood. A heart that devises wicked imaginations. Feet that be swift in running to mischief a false witness that speaks lies, and he that sows discord among brethren. We talked about this a little bit with the guys this weekend. The Bible says in Psalm 133, verse 1, how good it is, how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It says it's like where the oil was poured down over Aaron as a priest and the anointing fell. You've got to get brethren dwelling together in unity to have God to come in and anoint the environment. So discord is always the devil's plan. He wants to sow disunity, discord, confusion, chaos, anarchy. He has to do that. A house divided against itself cannot stand. Don't let outside forces sow discord into the house of God. You secure your salvation by being a person relating to Jesus on the vertical. That secures you in your slot, and everybody that's doing the same thing that you are doing will be on one accord with you all by, by themselves. There's no effort involved in this if you just do what you're supposed to do to get yourself right with God. Now, after he says all of that, look what he says. Now, here's the, here are the, the actual powers of discord and what causes major disunity in the body of Christ. My son, keep thy father's commandment, and forsake not the law of thy mother. Bind them continually upon thine heart, and tie them about thy neck. When you go, it shall, it shall lead thee. When you sleep, it shall keep thee. And when you awake, it shall talk with thee. For the commandment is a, a lamp, and the law is light. And reproofs of instruction are the way of life. You're not going to get past reproofs. You're not going to get past God correcting you. Don't despise reproofs and corrections. Embrace them. Because God is going to do what? Chasing every child he receives. He's going to scourge everybody. He's going to whip everybody. So just accept reproofs are the way of life. If you don't do that, you're going to forsake your own mercy. Instructions are the way of life. To keep thee from who? Now look what, look what all discouraging and correcting is about. There's an evil woman lying in wait for this boy, this son that he's talking to. Don't forsake the law of your mother and keep your father's commandments. Now, in it, anytime you see the Bible talking, father and mother are types of the Father God and the Holy Ghost. So keep the commandments of the Father and don't forsake the leading and the guidance, the law of your mother. See, those two things balance you out to be able to see. If you understand that Jesus is the amalgamated man, he's the fullness of the Godhead in bodily form. See, so if you get God the Father and God the Holy Ghost, in Jesus, you have both of their character traits combined in him, so you have both the discipline and the nurturing in one person. So he's a commander, 
going to war against the devil, yet he's a nurturer raising God's kids and nurturing them at the same time. So the attributes of both the Father and the Holy Ghost come together in the Son, and you get the actual manifestation of the totality of who God is. If you understand that, you understand what we're in and why there's so much animosity against Jesus. People will believe they represent Jesus in a total deception because they don't understand who he is, what he's about, and what he's after. And I'm going to show you how if you leave out any part of the Godhead, you'll be deceived. You can't make God all judgmental and dictatorial. You can't make him all nurturing and loving. He's a judge, and he's somebody that offers mercy and grace. He's going to send people to hell and be responsible for doing so, and he's going to bring people to heaven, redeeming them from sin. So all these things are in play, and God changes character based on what he's doing at any particular time. So don't lock up on one character trait of God because just like you, God is multifaceted. You know, you know the problem with people? And Rashid brought this up this morning. We were talking. He said, look, people are not multifaceted anymore. They lock up on one thing and it becomes their whole life. You got to have something you do. I remember in the military, I used to go and uh, do pottery. I'd go and do, you know, molds of clay and fire them and make bowls and make jars and make uh, sets of, you know, holders for flour and sugar and salt and pepper and stuff, you know. So I go down to the place where you do all the pottery and the artwork, and I spend the day making pottery, you know. You know, that's, that's a nice, relaxing devil. You, if you never did it, go and get yourself a hobby or something. And I was making bowls and pots and stuff, you know, giving them away and, you know. And it was an enjoyable day on Saturday morning to go make pottery. Some folk never have anything with Rashid photography. It's an outlet. It's a hobby. It's something that's now translating into a money-making endeavor. Man, don't get caught up in locking up. You know, it's bad to wake up every day thinking about one thing that you're just caught up in and just, <clears throat> you're just angry about it all day or mad about it and fixated on it, posting about it all day on the Internet. Man, ain't nobody fixated on nothing like that, man. Have other things that you do. Go fishing. Don't be legalistic around your wife. I teach guys this all the time. Man, go home back to your wife, man, and go somewhere shopping. Let somebody keep the kids and go to the Baskin Robbins and get some ice cream. It's bad when you're so st stiff and stoic. You just can't even relax. The word of God says, the word. Man, relax, man. What's wrong with you? See, you overcompensate when you are not really secure in Christ, so you begin to try to do things. That's a bad mistake. You got to let God, through Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, form Christ in you. Christ is normal. You know, Christ is a normal person. He doesn't do anything crazy and stupid. He doesn't call attention to himself. You're not somewhere yelling and screaming and beating up folk and breaking down stuff and putting his hand through sheetrock and all that kind of stuff. He's a normal person. We're trying to return people back to normalcy, and folks that come into a church environment run past Christ and become a nutcase. You got to run to Christ, conform to him, so you'll be normalized again to become a normal human being. But see, what you got to evaluate in yourself is how many closed doors you got in your soul that you think are normal, but they're not normal. Did you not know you can close yourself up inside of yourself to compensate for what you did in the world? It's like a woman that was out there fornicating, and she's really closed herself up to men for a reason. You know what it is? You ever had a girlfriend who was laying around with a guy and fornicating and said, we did the nasty? You ever heard that phrase? Y'all been, been around now. Don't be trying to... <laughs> Don't be trying to act like y'all ain't heard that now. I know y'all heard. Y'all probably said that a couple of times. Everybody want to try to pull a holy stunt now. But you know what happened to you? You will process into your mind that sexual activity is nasty. So now you're trying not to be nasty by being a nun and a, you know, subdued holy woman because sex is now nasty to you 
And now you can't even join yourself to somebody and get married because even any kind of sex in a marriage bed is doing the nasty. You got to have that stuff, man, eliminated from your soul because now you got a perverted, perverted imagery about something that God made and gave us. You got to normal, be normalized. See, you can do a lot of things that you think you're being holy about when, in fact, you're really bound about it. You're really chained up about it because of your sin. You can overcompensate. I told the guys this at the man-up meeting. You can try to be a man of God so hard that you eliminate whole sections of your life. You know, I'm, I'm a man of God. The only thing that matters is God. And you start saying it like G-A-U-D, God. I'm a man of God. Man, relax, man. What's wrong with you? You know, now you try to see a woman in a certain light because you were a fornicator. Now you're trying to be a holy man. And now, I know you don't have no lipstick on. Or, you see, you'll go off the deep end because you're overcompensating for your sin. You still got a sin consciousness, but you don't even know it. Because you've overcompensated and trying to be an ultra, hyper holy man or woman because of your sin. You got to let God expunge all the damage done in you from sin, whether it be negative or positive damage. What I mean by that, you can't participate in sin and be a dirty, low down person like you used to be, but don't run past Christ and become more holy than Christ. <laughs> you know, the problem with the Lord is the Lord ain't holy enough. That's what the problem is. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? The Lord just ain't holy enough. I was in there about to beat somebody to death over what they were doing, and the Lord wouldn't even stand with me in my costing them because the Lord just ain't holy enough. The Lord need to learn holiness. And you stand in front of Jesus. Without holiness, no man shall see the Lord, Jesus. <laughs> what they tell him? Why don't you wash your hands before you eat? Why don't your servant wash their hands before they eat? See, Jesus wasn't measuring up to their standards. He wasn't holy enough. You can deceive yourself in your own persona Believing that all the self-righteous dictates you made for you have to be transferred to other people to measure up to your standards and you're bound in self-righteousness overcompensating for your sin. You got to stay before the Lord until sin consciousness is totally expunged from you so you become a level-headed normal person. That'll stop you from berating your wife to make her measure up to some kind of perceived standard of self-righteousness that you set up for her. You got to get, man, you got you to gotta war to deaden flesh. Flesh is a, it's a chameleon. It changes form. It transforms. It, it, it modifies itself. You know, it'll be one thing and then transform it to another. And you'll think this is God, but it's just another form of flesh. Flesh has got to die. God's remedy for flesh and sin is execution, not repairing it. You can't repair flesh. Flesh has got to die because it's just going to change up and come a different way. And see, you can't teach people things. I found out there's some things that can't be taught. They have to happen to you. And the inside of you, inside of you has to change until you find out that 90% of the stuff you thought mattered doesn't matter at all. Because you'll start off in this, and you'll get around church activities trying to live out what you thought what is what God wanted. You don't know what God wants because nobody ever seen God. Nobody ever got inside of God's mind and understood God. He's an eternal being. You don't know all the different dictates that make up God. So you have to approach God as an abstract personality because we don't know and can, and can never know all of the inner workings of an abstract eternal mind. So you just got to go abstract. And you just got to let him flow and lead and guide you and be calm and satisfied. And if he wants to get in touch with you, he will. But we think up a lot of stuff that's not even inside of God's kingdom nor his mind 
and we make it true to we make it true to us, and then we begin to make people believe that this is what's right. You can't do that. Any fixation on another human proves that you're bound. You're bound. Because Jesus Christ is the standard, and if my affection is above, I'm conforming to him, and I'm not trying to make you see it my way. I'm not interested in you seeing anything my way. You shouldn't be interested in me seeing anything your way. You should be conforming on Christ, conforming to Christ, and performing his will. And his will is to save as many as he can before he destroys this place. So there's a lot of stuff in play dealing with this. And when you deal with these forces of the devil, he's always trying to divine something on you to make you conscious of people. And you try to tell them none of this matters. This is a temporary world. Nothing is real and that is not permanent. See, when you say nothing is real, that's always talking about the permanence of it. See, a lot of folks say, well, you know, this wall is real. You're saying if you run against that wall, you won't knock yourself out. It's not real. No, what I'm telling you is going to be dissolved. He already said everything we see will be dissolved, burn up. So it's not permanent. So it can't have a permanence in your mind and you can't afford to fixate on it. Like I say, anybody you hate, your hatred will go away when they die. Or else you'll be bound with the hatred for them even in the grave. Your daddy could be dead and hated by you and still plaguing you from the grave. Think about what I'm saying. Your dad had been dead 10 years and what he did and said is still plaguing and cursing you from the grave. You ever seen that movie, um, Ben-Hur? When Masala died and he had a hold of Ben Hur, Ben Hur's shirt, and he had you ever seen that movie? And if Ben Hur had to pry Masala's hands off of his shirt, because Masala had played Ben Hur his whole life, and he had to pry his hand off of him and let him get off his shirt. He died gripping Ben Hur's shirt, and he had to pry his fingers loose. That's the way. That's the way it is, man. When you're caught up in hatred and vitriol and despising people and trying to forecast your hatred on them and thinking you're doing the will of God. Man, that's a sad state of affairs right there. And what I'm saying is we got to get above all of that in order not to contaminate relationships that God wants us to have, especially male-female relationships. You trying to be sealed up and not be what you used to be is sin. That's sin. I'm trying not to be what I was and letting the, instead of letting the grace of God remake me into a new creation that's by nature not what I was. Your effort is pride and rebellion against God's process. It's a trick, man. I'm telling you, the devil's got a lot of ways to do it to you. And you'll walk around kind of sober and somber always, you know. Hi. Good evening. Praise the Lord. But you're really just sealed up and locked up inside. You can't even enjoy life. It's bad when you're so sealed up, you can't even enjoy your own life from the self-imposed limitations you put on your own life that God never did. You don't want to become a dictator and a Pharisee in this. You don't want to become a self-righteous man or woman. You got to let God build his house. You got to let God refabricate the human. You don't want to become the standard for what God is doing because the only standard is Jesus Christ. And so you can tell as we live down here, we're in a, we're in a whirlwind, a hurricane of activity down here. You see how much stuff spirals around you? You can't afford to stick your head out there in a hurricane. Because the rest of your body might stay here, but your head going to go with the wind flow. <laughs> so your neck going to get locked off. And, you know, your head going to go in the, in, in, the, in the swirling part of the hurricane while your, your body drops to the ground dead. You don't want to stick your head and your mind into too much stuff. Because people live in chaos and they live in a hurricane. The winds of a hurricane. Man, don't let your mind get over there with these folk, man. They have so much chaos and stuff in their minds, 
that they'll try to import chaos into your life. And you can't afford to have chaos. Look how much stuff you already got going on. <laughs> Think about when you're going to add somebody else's chaos to your, to your life. Man, don't do that, man. Don't do it. So these spiritual forces are always in play trying to get you to compromise and get you out there with them so you lose focus on Jesus Christ. So you now you have the commandment of your father, the law of your mother, right there to govern you and keep you in the middle of the road. Keep everything in the middle of the road. That's the father's will and the instructions and the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. It's all compiled and housed in Jesus. Jesus is the express image of those natures in bodily form. So look at this. He says, For the commandment is a lamp and the law is a light, and reproofs of instruction are the way of life, to keep thee from the evil woman, from the flattery of the tongue of a strange woman. That word strange is alien, a woman of a different kind. Lust not after her in, in her beauty in your heart, neither let her take thee with her take thee with her eyelids. For by means of a whorish woman, a man is brought to what? A piece of bread. And the adulteress will hunt for the precious life. That word for life there is the nefesh, which is the spirit. Hunt for the precious spirit. Hunting for your spirit. Trying to bind you, chain you up. An adulteress will hunt for the precious life. These kinds of people are only stimulated by that marriage band on your finger as a man. She watching you to see if you got a ring on because you're a precious life that's in covenant with another woman and that actually inspires them even more to get you. They don't want you. They just want to put out the light and destroy the precious life. You got to know that. This is a volatile arena we're walking around in, and you got to settle it inside of yourself, man. It's volatile. You need, the, you need God to stay close to you. You got to stay close to God now because there's a lot of forces in play down here. Can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes not be burned? Can one go upon hot coals and his feet not be burned? So he that goeth unto his neighbor's wife, whosoever touches her shall not be innocent. Men do not despise a thief if he steal to satisfy his soul when he is hungry. But if, but if he be found, he shall restore sevenfold. He shall give all the substance of his house. But whoso committeth adultery with a woman lacks understanding. He that doeth it destroys his own soul. You don't know. See, a lot of times folk have committed adultery and they didn't know it because the person lied about being married. So you, don't, you could have been out there and don't even know you was out there now. Because you took them at face value and they lied. And now you're in adultery and didn't even know you were in adultery because you didn't know they, they never got a divorce. And even a divorcement does not mean you're free to commit adultery. He says, look, you destroy your own soul. A wound and dishonor shall he get and his reproach shall not be wiped away. For jealousy is the rage of a man, therefore he will not spare in the day of vengeance. He will not regard any ransom, neither will he rest content, though thou givest many gifts. My son, keep my words and lay up my commandments with thee. Keep my commandments and live, and my law as the apple of thine eye. You know, you got to get back to a disciplined, focused study of the word of God, like you used to do. Go back, man. We did the whole book of 1 John Wednesday night. Go back to systematic Bible study for yourself. Reading the word of God. I said, at the start off the new year, I'm going to go. I did 1 John. I'm going to go 2 John, 3 John, then the Gospel of John. I'm going to do that little pattern myself in January just to kind of anchor me for 2020 and then go from there. I like to keep going over the book of Acts. Because Acts is where it's at. We should be living in Acts, man. You know what I'm saying? That's kind of, it's kind of a frustrating thing not to see Acts going full blast. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, I just meditate on that. I just keep telling God, God, the book of Acts, come on. 
He says, keep my commandments and, li and live, and my law is the apple of thine eye. Bind them upon thy fingers, write them upon the table of thine heart. Say unto wisdom, you are my sister, and call understanding thy kinswoman. Now, how, you see how he's contrasting this with the harlot, with the whorish woman? He says, in contrast to the whorish woman, what you do is this. You call wisdom your sister and call understanding your kinswoman, your auntie or somebody. Why, man? That they may keep thee from what? The strange woman, that word there for strange woman is perverse woman. From the stranger which flattereth with her words. That's a key, man. When you're getting accosted by a woman trying to destroy you as a man, flattery is the inroad. And what that thing banks on is that you need the flattery and the undergirding and support of that strange woman. See, a guy unfettered from God got to find some other headship. And his headship becomes the approval of strange women. He performs for strange women. I can guarantee you when Alton was in the 12th grade and he got him a new car, in his mind, the first thing he thought, when I pull up, the babes, the babes, the babes, the babes. That's what I'm looking for. Deke will get a haircut in Adamsville. Deke he, he got naturally curly hair, so his hair was slick down and be waved up. Everybody tried to get a stocking cap to make their hair look like Deke's. <laughs> <laughs> now you got Murray's grease and packed it on your head real thick. <laughs> then cut your mama's stocking up and got a butt whipping for cutting your mama's stocking up. <laughs> Slam the stocking on real tight and look like Japanese eyes because the <laughs> stocking cap was on so tight. And Deke would always come bragging to us. I got waves for the babes and curls for the girls. <laughs> Shut up, Deke. If I want to hear that mess, get out of here. <laughs> like that, that character in, in uh, Charlie Brown that had natural wavy hair or whatever. So it was always a consciousness of what the girls think about what you're doing. You got dressed for the girls. You went to the club for the girls. You got a certain kind of car for the girls. You were nothing but somebody who had the girls as an idol, and everything you did was to impress the girls. And they knew that. And what did it do? It transferred your strength and power to them. Because guess what? If you're doing everything to impress them, their disapproval would cut you to the quick. They could control whether or not you were a man or not by what they signed off on. So what happens now? Like I tell a guy like Nick, Nick, his age. These girls his age are going to try to build a boy. How? Especially those older girls, a little older than him. They're going to get him under their wing and build a boy. I'm going to make you over into what I say you ought to be what like, and I like Lil Wayne. So why don't you get some tats? Why don't you grow your hair out into some dreads? Why don't you tattoo a cross on the side of your head and get some gold grill slammed into your mouth? Pull your pants down to your booty. Come on, man. Hey, try some of this syrup, bro. Roll a joint, man. Smoke this blunt. See, they're going to try to build the boy. To do what? To walk around, to accommodate them, to confirm them, to be an image of what they want a boy or a man to look like. If he lives up to their standards, he has now become a little girl to a man. Because she's a man that build the boy. That's why, as a man... To go through a rite of passage, he needs to be around the men. And not a bunch of men that are in servitude to women. Men who have made Christ their head. If you have single women in a, an assembly, then all the men are responsible for taking on the raising of their boys and their girls by modeling manhood to even the little girls. That's the responsibility that we got to bear. It is what it is. You can't run from it. But guess what? Every man that's still trying to seek the approval of a woman 
will hate your guts. Because he knows instinctively he's been castrated. He can't be a man, so he has to fight a man. Notice Ahab when Elijah walked in. You are the man that's troubling Israel. What was that, based, what was that all based on? The fact that Jezebel approved of him as a man. It wouldn't be any trouble because she's already killed all the prophets. The ones that weren't killed are being hidden. I'm living in a lap of luxury. She's killed Naboth so I could get his land, his vineyard. And here you come with what? The word of God. Here you come as a prophet bringing the word of God and you're exposing the fact that I'm not a man. Even if you're a man that was raised in a house with a dominant mother, you will work to please feminine character because your daddy modeled his weakness before you, and you by nature will curl up under a woman because that's what your daddy did. That's why you got to let Christ be made into your head. And everybody that does not conform to what I'm saying will hate this message by nature. They have to hate it because proper headship and authority is not in place. See, it is what it is. Your life proves what I'm saying is right. If you went out there hunting for an unstable soul in a man, look what he turned into. Look what he did to you. Look what he said to you. In a tight place, look how he abandoned you. Look, look at the names he called you when he cussed you. Now, I want you to reel it back in now. I don't want you to meditate on it and get bound and get ready to shoot somebody and, you know, hack somebody to death after you think about it. But you really, really process what he called you when he was really mad. Because an angry man speaks a, a, a man that's not angry is mine. See, that's what he really thought about you. When he got mad and what he called you, that's what he really thought about you. Female dog, old ho, no good so-and-so. And then try to make up with you. A woman can't get right after that, man. Because those daggers go in deep, Jack. Angry at his mother's dominance. Angry at being castrated. Why do you think those units threw Jezebel out that window so fast? You know what they were mad about? <laughs> she cut them off. She castrated them. When that man finally said, throw her down. Shoot. <laughs> Wait. For oh, gone. Head first. That's why guys walk around mad at women. Because they know they've been castrated. But the guys that don't fight for their gonads, they're going to hate every guy that fights for his gonads. See, if you don't fight for yours, you're going to hate a guy that gets his. It's bad, man. It's a bad situation down here. It is bad. It is pitiful down here. We're living in it. A man is now Tyler Perry. A man has always got to put on a dress out there to fit in. Fit in. Wonder why Michael Strahan is everywhere. You don't know. You know he put on that dress, right? You know uh, Snipes had to put on that dress. Wesley Snipes. We won't even talk about Medea. That's all indoctrination. What you do when you do that, you offer up your manhood publicly. Now they approve of you and stamp you approved. See, this is what's going on. You got to be castrated. You got to be a eunuch. You can have no masculine character in the devil's economy because a heterosexual man is not acceptable in the devil's economy. You've got to get rid of them. You bind the strong man, you spoil the house. That's what this is all about. See, but the focus can't be trying to make another person see it. The focus is you conforming to Christ yourself and obeying what he told you to do. We're burning too much fuel trying to change somebody else. Let me just be conformed to Christ and transformed by him, renewing my mind, and I'll just do as I'm told. But guess what? If you walk in that, 
Everybody not like you is studying to throw rocks at you. Trying to destroy you to do what? They hunt for the precious life. They hunt for the one that's conforming to Christ, whether you be male or female. If you become a woman, there wants to be a woman indeed and not fight men and just be in a submissive role that's supplementing and complimenting men. I think a Jezebel spirit hates you more than a man. Because you were the fifth column sent by us to actually make sure they never make it. First thing we saw when we walked out of a meeting yesterday afternoon was a girl in skin-tight stretch pants and six-inch heels in the lobby with a cut-off midriff top strutting around looking for a victim. She worked, I mean, I, can't, I didn't believe nobody's head could move that many different directions. <laughs> Back, up, down. What's, what's wrong with you? Hunting for the precious life. Seeing if I can find an unstable soul that's going to be checking me out so that I can put myself in position to get into that pocket to get that money. Because there's a lot of hookers over there on Virginia Avenue if you don't know. They work the hotels. LSU and Oklahoma in town. A lot of high rolling guys come in town for the game and their wives don't come. So they park themselves in those hotel lobbies, man, and work the bars and work the lobbies. Call girls called up to the rooms. You got call girl numbers all through Atlanta. Don't read Creative Loafing. It's full of it. See, it's all about hunting for the unstable soul. This thing is about commerce now. Young high school girls in 11th and 12th grade, they want to be strippers. And strippers have side jobs as prostitutes. Because I guarantee if you're putting money on a stripper stage for a stripper, she already butt naked in front of 300 guys. For another grand, she back at the room with you, bro. Because there's no mor morality. There's no checks built into it. I'm going to do whatever the money dictates for me to do. So to come out of this world right now and be saved, you got to be a person that's focused and disciplined, and you want God to save you. You got to come in running low, begging God to keep me, save me. God's got to save you coming in. He's got to keep you through the process and then extricate you out of here in a rapture at the end. And you got to finish the drill. Anywhere you get out of that process, you're lost. He got to save you at the front door, keep you walking down the hall, and get you out the back door. If you forsake him, if you turn away from him, your mind's going to begin to run in reverse, and what should be your friend will become your enemy and what should be your enemy will become your friend. And I'll be sitting up with a witch, a warlock, a sorcerer, somebody from the devil, and calling them the prophet of God. And I'm hearing from the Lord. You ain't hearing from the Lord. You're hearing from a soulish, make-believe God of this world that is inspiring you not to go on and get your manhood or womanhood back. I'm telling you. Everybody in God's economy is patriarchal because God is a father. Jesus is a conduit to the father. The end game is the father. It's not, you don't just come to Jesus and stay with him. Jesus says, I'll come and my father will come with you, with, into you and make our abode in you. He is an introduction to the father. The Holy Ghost reveals Jesus. Jesus reveals the father. Now you're complete in him, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. See, if you don't have that process accomplished, you've got some type of a detriment or some type of a lack in you because you don't have the whole picture as far as the Godhead is concerned. So every force down here is trying to deter you away from what? The process. It's the process. Don't forsake the process. Stay in the process. I tell anybody coming to me, do the mechanics, stay in the process. It'll change you all by itself. You don't have to do a lot of working and sweaty effort. Get in the front door, stay in the process. Stay on Jesus' hip. Stay in that word. Stay in prayer and fasting. Stay in a place of that praise and worship pouring over you. Don't forsake the process. Part of the process is not to forsake the assembling of yourselves together. That's part of the process. As iron sharpens iron, 
so does a man sharpen the countenance of his friend. Anytime you get a young boy begin to sit up under women, the boy is doomed. I told Nick, Nick, this weekend, man, go to school. Make it through middle school, high school, get your degree, get your career, and then find somebody like yourself, a girl that did the same thing. Get married and live happily ever after, although it ain't no fairy tale. <laughs> You'll give your strength to women. You know it's a curse in the African culture for a man to sit up under a woman and get his hair done? That you a cursed man? Because a man should never sit up under a woman and get braids and little trinkets put in his hair and get his curly curls curly cued up and that's emasculating. And what do you see it everywhere? Some guy with curly cued hair walking around with his curly cues and all this stuff draped down his back and tied in little knots and knot naps. And man, go get a haircut. Give me a straight raise and I'll, I'll set you straight right here. I'll set you free right here, bro. <laughs> it's a shame for a man to have long hair. Didn't the man say that? What's the debate about? What's the talk about? The book gives you the instructions of life, the Bible says. Just read it and just do what it says. But trying to fit into a feminized, matronized culture, I began to feminize my outer countenance to fit in and be accepted by the Jezebelian witches. And now I'm adamantly set against all manhood and calling it the Holy Ghost. The whore is now your Holy Ghost. That's what's leading you. Oh, I'm going to show you how it works in just a minute. Just keep your wig tied on tight. Oh, you don't have a wig on. <laughs> <laughs> Look at this. He says that they may keep thee from the strange woman, from the stranger which flatters with her words. Beware of these words, y'all. Beware of flattering words. For at the window of my house, I looked through my casement. I beheld among the simple ones. I discerned among the youths. A young man void of understanding, an ignorant man, passing through the street near her corner. And he went the way to her house. In the twilight, in the evening, in the black and dark night. And behold, there met him a woman with the attire of a harlot and subtle of heart. She was standing in the lobby of the Crown Plaza Hotel. <laughs> Did y'all see her down there? Y'all know the See? Oh, wait, wait. Yeah, yeah, uh -huh. yeah, uh -huh. yeah. Yeah, yeah, I saw, yeah, saw it. Hallelujah, I did. <laughs> but she was out, she had, man, she had the body now. The body was, she, she lived in the gym. She lived under a gym or something. She lived in a gold gym or something. <laughs> but I'm looking. The bait is on the hook. I'm searching for an unstable soul. I'll come with flattery. Have you noticed now that everybody wears bat wings for eyelashes? <laughs> now when eyelashes wear, well, eyelashes, bat the eyes be a whoosh, whoosh. Like one of those Egyptian fans that the Egyptian be fanning Queen of Sheba with, you know, like whoosh. whoosh. Oh, go on. <laughs> Why is everybody wearing these big old? Looking like the, you know, strands on a straw broom, you know. That's what they, the minds, man, get accosted by all this stuff. You conform to it. You don't even know how you look with all this. It's not appealing to guys because guys don't like phony. You're going to be pretty, but you got to be natural really to appeal to a guy. You got on too much stuff, man. You got on too much stuff. It's just like it overbearing. You just got on so much stuff that I don't know if you a Terminator or what you a <laughs> Transformer or something. I don't even know. You see, the devil always operates in extremes. And then he'll market it and he'll model it to people and they'll just emulate it. Never be led by sight and sound in the world. 
Because sight and sound is always off. Whatever you keep seeing and hearing, that's the devil trying to mold you into something. Man, let the Lord give you a style. Let the Lord give you a fashion sense. Let the Lord give you your identity as far as what you dress like, walk like, talk like, and how you present yourself. You got to learn how to present yourself as a woman to society for you to get the respect of society. Don't let the patterns and the modeling of the world get you caught up in the fashions of this life. Man, that's a trick of the devil. And it'll have you looking crazy because did you not know the transvestite look is in vogue? Ain't nobody built like some of these women you see on TV and singing songs and stuff. They done took out ribs to get their waist cinched in tight. Then they go and buy a big old giant balloon behind, go and get a bunch of silicone pumped into the chest. So now they got a 48, 22, 46 figure. And walk it in, you know. Optimus Prime, you know. <laughs> what kind of mess is this? And then you're trying to somehow look like this. You're in the gym about to kill yourself, and they bought all that. You can't work that up or out to get like that. Man, I don't care about you lifting weights till you about half dead. <laughs> that is definitely not real because that's the same thing a transvestite does. He puts in artificial body parts. So a woman that emulates and reflects a transvestite has become the status quo of the culture. And everybody trying to look like this make-believe person. Man, if you've got three kids, embrace your stress, uh, stress marks. There's no big deal about having stretch marks. Hey, man, that's the, that's the emblems of war. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? We walk around ashamed that I got stretch marks and nobody, man, nobody even caring about it. Who going to see them anyway unless you're doing something you got no business? <laughs> Think about what I'm saying. See, the devil is always trying to castigate and downgrade people and put them down. That's all he does, man. You got to get into Christ, get you an identity in Christ, be satisfied with the Lord accepting you. You're accepting the beloved man and walk on down the street. And if he shows you things that are not like what he wants you to be like, embrace it and change. Yeah. Repent and change. That's all you got to do. Don't despise the vessel that brings it. Just yield. It's like when the cops pull you over and trying to get you to get out of the car and you up there cussing at him and yelling at him. Now, he on the radio. You know what he called him? Back up. Now, you got four cop cars with five or six cops. And you still cussing and yelling. They're gonna tell you, they're gonna tell you one thing. Comply. I'm telling you to turn around, put your hands on that car. Look, 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 you don't understand what I'm saying. I'm trying to tell y'all that look, this guy stopped me. And I'm gonna tell you again, fella. Turn around, place your hands on the car. You need to comply. They might tell you a maximum maybe three times. You might make it to four. And after that, pow, 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 pow. You know what I'm saying? Billy clubs, rifles, gun butts, shotgun handles, huh? tasers. Then somebody said, man, why didn't you just comply? I don't want nobody, then nobody to be telling. All God is telling the human race is what? Comply. Why don't you just comply and do what I tell you? You know, a person would do anything but what God says to do. Have you noticed that? You ever talk to one of your kids that's kind of rebellious and crazy? They'll do anything but what the Lord is telling them to do. They'll go decades, their life looking like Swiss cheese, and all they got to do is just stop and comply. The mind, the human mind is something else, man. It'll get outrageous. It'll get crazy. It'll go into all kinds of just you know, frenetic energy pouring out of it, all not to comply with the simple commandment. Just do as you're told and you'll be okay. But I'm going to do anything but what I'm told to do. Folk don't like commandments. When the commandments come, 
sin revives, and I die. It's something in a human that's not it is unrepentant. When you're an unrepentant human, you are right in a generic service where you're preaching like this. See, because it ain't on you. But when somebody says, Ashley, you. See, now. If you don't get your finger out of my face, I'll kill you. See? <laughs> See? It stopped being generic, and now it's on me. It's my turn at bat. And if you've been around this long enough, He's going to eventually come see you. See, it's going to stop being generic one day. It's going to come to see you. Now, what you do when it comes to see you is going to determine your eternal destiny. Agree with the Lord quickly and just repent and change, and you go forward and keep going. But, boy, when you act like that he didn't say what he just said to you and it ain't real, now you got to go all around the mulberry bush and have those billy clubs on your head for the next six months because you didn't comply. Comply, and you'll get out of it. I'm serious, man. You got to evaluate anything that's said, whether or not it be so. I don't blow anything off. I evaluate what's said, and if it's so, hey, man, I got to change. But I'm not going to take airheaded gibberish as truth that has no foundation. I got to know that I know that it's real to comply with it. Look at this. He says, And behold, among the simple ones I discerned among the youths, a young man void of understanding. So I tell young guys like Nick, Nick, his age, don't be a boy void of understanding. You got people that have gone down that street before they can tell you what's down that street. Man, there's a lot of folks down there that's going to rob you, man. You're going to get mugged on that street. Don't go down Broadway because about 12 o'clock in the evening, they mugging people. Oh, man, oh, yeah, I ain't scared of that, man. Hey, I'm going on down here. <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> Crazy. Come back missing an arm. Well, didn't I tell you not to go down there? I didn't believe you. What you don't believe, man, can be very harmful and de detrimental to you. A man void of understanding. If I know somebody that knows the way already, let me listen to them. Passing through the street near her corner, and he went the way to her house. In the twilight, in the evening, in the black and dark night. That's when the devil operates. And behold, there met him a woman with the attire of a harlot, and subtle of heart, meaning crafty and cunning. Look at the character traits. She is loud and stubborn, her feet abide not in her house. She cannot stay at home. Like they, they, my mama would tell my sister, why don't you keep your behind at home? Can't, a street woman. See, a street woman can't stay at home. Now is she without, now in the streets, and lies in wait at every corner. So she caught him and kissed him, and with an impudent face said unto him. An impudent face is a brazen face. Like what your mama called a brazen hussy. So they are at every corner lying in wait. We call that in today's vernacular surfing the web. That's what they're doing. When you see them out there in thongs on the web, on Facebook and these social medias, on Instagram, they searching for what? The unstable man, the unstable soul or woman because they look for women now too. You got lesbians surfing the web naked for other lesbians. See, they're looking for an unstable soul. She says, I have peace offerings with me this day. Have I paid my vows? Who she paid it to? Her demon God. I paid my vows to my demon God. Therefore came I forth to meet thee, diligently to seek thy face, and I have found thee. I have decked my bed with coverings of tapestry, with carved works, with fine linen of Egypt. I have perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come. Let us take our field of love until the morning. Let us solace ourselves with love. Now, you know, ain't no love in that bed. He's de she's dependent on lust, which is the devil's form of perverted love. Lust is the desire to satisfy self at the expense of somebody else. So a lot of guys that have been with women out there, a lot of us in here in the world, you don't care nothing about that girl. She was just a semen 
receptacle. I got lust on me. Old faithful Betty Lou is just like the volcano that erupts every six months in the, in, over here in Hawaii. Old faithful. So I'm going to go by Old Faithful's house to get me some to get this lust off of me. So I use it like a latrine. And you know your mind can be formatted and reformatted to be a latrine for a man. You just some, somewhere for him to dump a load of semen in. And that's what you become, a receptacle. And you're trying to divert all these young girls away from that while the world is telling them, girl, you're on top of your game. Girl, you running it strong. Girl, you slaying. Girl, you doing it. Ain't no morality. Don't worry about all that. Get his money, girl. You got to give up some, but get that money. Get the money. Get the money. No money, no honey. No loot, no boots. That's the song they make. So there's no morality attached to you denigrating yourself and giving up sex to a dude. That's become a semen dump. And you're on top of your game. You're in vogue. You're what's happening. You're a diva. There's no judgment against you, but your insides begin to rot away. Your insides become disgusting to the degree you can't even come around decent people. You know, a lot of people stay away from people that are decent because they feel so funny within themselves about what they've done that they can't even matriculate into an environment and assimilate into a situations where decent, normal people are. Because my own heart condemns me. I feel funny around folks because I know what I'm doing. They sit alone somewhere in the corner looking all crazy. It's sinning. I know everybody looking at me. I know they think I'm nasty and dirty and low down. Don't nobody even know you. I didn't even know your name. I didn't know you was here. <laughs> Self-awareness from sin. Can't you see when Adam and Eve fell, the first thing they became was self-aware? First thing that hit them. Trying to cover up their loins because they became self-aware. She says, therefore it came out forth to meet thee, diligent to seek thy face, and I found thee. I have decked my bed with coverings of tapestry, with carved works, with fine linen of Egypt. I have perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come, let us take our fill of love until the morning. Let us solace ourselves with loves. For the good man, that word is husband, is not at home. He is gone on a long journey. So come on over. You're going to go over to somebody's house in their bed, not knowing if that dude going to show up. Are you crazy? Then when he kicked the door in, you sitting there looking crazy. I came in here to prepare the refrigerator. Come on, man. Come on, man. <laughs> come on, man. He have taken a bag of money with him and will come home at the day appointed. With her much fair speech, she caused him to yield. Look what happened. She breaking you down, bruh. You don't want to talk too long to them. Don't be engaging these folk, man, that's skilled in flattery and oratory and harlotry because they know how to talk about A, trying to achieve B. With her much fair speech, who did that in the Bible? Delilah. See how she broke down Samson? With her much fair speech, man, that don't know when to cut the conversation short because talk can erode away into flirtation. And they're going to read you like a book now because they got on all the stuff. They got everything right now for what they're doing. And they see you paying attention to them. Oh, that's a nice necklace you got on. That ain't what she heard. What she heard was, oh, you want me. Oh, I see you noticing me. I see you noticing me. Then she's going to turn that gear up. That gear going to go up. You're going to see that thing come up. Oh, I got this over at Macy's. You know, just, just, you know what you just did? You just awakened a sleeping giant. You awakened hell with a simple compliment. You better, you got the man. You better stop fooling around with this dragon woman. It's folk that got dragons down in their soul, and you can call them dragons up. 
you didn't even, you, you might not have been innocently not saying much and mean nothing by it. You might, you could really be unconscious of what you said, but that ain't what they heard. You got to be aware of who you dealing with. Who you dealing with. You know, there's nothing wrong with paying somebody a compliment. If I see Mallory, I say, oh, Mallory, girl, you're looking good. That's a nice black dress. Praise the God. You know, to see how the kid doing, girl. Be nothing to it. You said to somebody else, mm-hmm. <laughs> ha! <laughs> you see, because you got to know who you're talking to. That's how you monitor it, man. If you got to change ebb and flow based on where you're in. I'm not going to go down here to the LSU-Oklahoma game and not know what's down. You, are you crazy? You got tactical killers, assassins walking around down there. And you try to just be a dodo bird walking around. Man, wake up out of that coma, man. You know, some of your wife's sisters will take you out. Cousins, some of your female cousins will take you out. I'm telling you, man, you can't be around as a dumbbell in this just thinking everything is simple and everything is innocent because we're in a volatile environment, man. It's volatile. You got little girls walking around 13 built like 25-year-old women, and they will seduce you. You can be sitting there with a 50- or 60-year-old man, and they'll come at you like a grown woman to be 13 years old. And you say, I thought they were 25. Yeah, but you tell them down at the, at the, at the, at the, at the police precinct that, because when you get ready to go to, you got jail bait on your hand, bro. Stop, you know, just get with the Lord. See, can't nobody accuse you of nothing at home watching Andy Griffin. With me, it's Mannix. Look, at 7 o'clock, I was watching Mannix. Reruns and Mannix. I record them every day. I got about 35 reruns and Mannix. I play them back to back. So at 7.30 last night, what you accused me of didn't happen because I was looking at Mannix. So you can't, I wasn't even there. I was looking at Mannix. Mannix. Joseph Mannix. See, that's how you stay. And you at home by yourself with your wife looking at an old movie, you know you're secure. If you live alone as a guy, Go home. Women, go home. There's nothing out there. There's nothing in the streets. What you looking for? When I was just out here looking, you better go home and start being a looky-loo and stay safe. That fair speech caused him to yield. With the flattering of her lips, she forced him. With the flattering of her lips, she forced him? See, baby browns and painted lips and painted face and curly cues dropping down her back, that can do a lot of damage, man, if your mind is over there. And you got to know times and seasons that are affecting you at a certain time. See, the devil knows when to strike. Just when your husband made you mad and you leave home a little irritated, that's when that joker turn that cone on you. Were you looking for something in the store? Can I help you carry that box to your car? Are you sure? I can help you with the boxes. Are you sure? Hmm? 6'4? 220? Hmm? Biceps, triceps, body like Adonis. Are you sure? Hmm? You see the curls in the waves? (laughs) Have you noticed the curls in the waves? Have you seen the flashing brown baby browns? Huh? Are you sure you don't want that box? Positivity can be turned around to negativity in certain, certain cases. Have you smelled the cologne? Hmm? Hmm? You remember your boyfriend in the 12th grade? I look just like him. Remember him? See, the devil, the devil mess around with your mind. And the guy walk away, it be over, and the devil on <laughs> Driving down the street. That cologne was nice. I've always liked light brown eyes. Okay. And boy, those biceps was kicking. 
you trying to turn up some praise music. Hear those praises from a grateful heart. <laughs> now your mind saying, I want to see Mary. I didn't see no ring. Said, I'm telling you, man. It's a warfare. What happened to you? He divined on you. He designed you. And that spirit from him went with you. And it started talking to you. That's why it says, cast down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Bring it into captivity. Every thought to the obedience of Christ. You got to have some words stored in you, buddy. You got to make this a word war. This ain't World War III. It's Word War III. You got to be able to pull some up out of you. If you're going to bring things to your remembrance, the Holy Ghost, you got to have remembered something to tap into. So you got to meditate on this thing day and night. Because the devil is going to try to always come and just force you and tell you what to do. So, buddy, it is written. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. Every tongue that rises against me in judgment is condemned. This this is the inheritance of the servants of the Lord. And my righteousness comes from the Lord Jesus Christ. You got to know that, believe that, meditate on that, quote that, proclaim it. See, you, proclamation is a weapon. Did you know that? Prayer, praise, proclamation, these are all weapons of warfare, and they all come out of your mouth. I'm telling you, man, we in something this time that the devil is a very stealth creature. If he can penetrate your mind and your thinking processes, he'll get you to think about him trying to distract you away from the mission of God. You got to stay focused, and the only thing to keep you focused is that word, that engrafted word that is able to save your soul. Let the long-tongued liars lie. Let the hypocrites billow. Stay focused on that word. He goeth after her straightway as an ox goes to the slaughter or as a fool to the correction of the stocks. Just like somebody going to prison, being chained to the wall. Till a dart strike through his liver as a bird hasted to the snare and knoweth not that it is for his life. Hearken unto me now, therefore, O you children, and attend to the words of my mouth. That word for life in verse 23 is nefesh again, his spirit. It's for his spirit. They're after your spirit. They're trying to chain and bind your spirit so the Holy Spirit can't flow out from your spirit. She's searching for your spirit to chain it up so you'll have no power to stop it. It's all demonic activity. Hearken unto me now, therefore, O you children, and attend to the words of my mouth. Let not thine heart decl decline to her ways. Go not astray in her paths. For she hath cast down many wounded. Yes, many strong men have been slain by her. Her house is the way to hell, going down to the chambers of death. That's a warning to men that would strike fear into my heart if I was a woman. I'd be scared to death if I was a woman. I can be weaponized by the devil. Eve was. Delilah was. Bathsheba was. Jezebel was, Herodias was, the Midianite night women were. That's terrifying. That something can get into me that the devil can actually project through me to try to stop the kingdom of God from progressing. Meaning God has to destroy me for the kingdom to progress. And he will destroy you. His kingdom must come. And anything in the way has to be eliminated. But you know what's wrong with people? The fear of God has been eliminated from the human race. They don't believe he'll do anything to anybody. And they don't believe that the end of the age has come. That he's really about to form up his church and he's going to bring it to a culmination. I don't believe that. So I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing thinking there's no just recompense. That's a bad mistake to make right there. And you can, all you do is tell people they keep on going. So Proverbs 6 and 7 outlines it, the curse of the whorish woman. What's really going on here? There's a contention going on. 
There is a war going on. And what's the war? Look at John 14, the Gospel of John, chapter 14. Tension and contention is in the environment now. What is causing all this animosity? What's the war about right now that we're embracing and engaging in? It's about God restoring the church to order. That's what it's, everything is about, that man. That dry bones are coming back alive to live. We have these man up meetings not to try to inspire men to be dictatorial, uh, you know, like a till of the Huns. It's to teach men to be selfless servants. Abdicate your authority, not to the devil, but to God. And let him penetrate you to make you a selfless servant, looking for nothing in return. Wash folks' feet and don't look for any repayment or any recompense. Become a selfless servant in the household of God. That's the lesson we teach. But guess what? That makes a Jezebel spirit even more angry. Because it don't like selfless servanthood. Why? Because God will rest on selfless servitude. Servanthood, uh, servanthood. Selfless ser servanthood will bring the power of God into play. That means that the Jezebel spirit has no throne. Don't want God around because it's going to dethrone me. So it wants a guy to be arrogant, proud, a big mouth, all knowing. You know, somebody just this dictatorial and condescending and putting people down. See, it, it likes that because it empowers the thing and it gives it something to shoot at. But when you're telling the people, don't follow me. Get to know the Lord for yourself. Let the Lord build you up in, in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost till Christ be formed in you and then amalgamate with the body as a member of the body with no self-awareness. See, that's how you, 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 you amalgamate into the body of Christ. Leadership is servanthood. If you want to be great in the kingdom of heaven, if you want to be great in the kingdom of God, if you want to be a leader, you must become a servant of all. That's why they hate servants. They hate folks that have no ulterior motive, no agenda, because it eliminates Jezebel from ruling, and a guy under that authority of that kind of a spirit, which is witchcraft, uses the woman and pimps her. You see, in your life, in the world fornicating, you hated your partner in fornication. You might have thought what you felt was love. That wasn't love. You know what that was that gave you that adrenaline rush as a woman? It was power over him. That wasn't love. That was power. That's the, the adrenaline rush and the dopamine rush and the exhilaration of domination of a weak dude. And you called it love because it made you feel good. Him cowering down and you know, knees knocking together, shaking up by you when you come around just because you could throw a body on him and he just break down. And y'all just love him. He's so cute. And pet him on his little head. You little cutie. I love you. You're a cutie pie. And he was just like a little boy to you because you knew whenever you threw them hips on him and put that thing on him, he just melt like jello, like ice on a hot skillet, yeah. <laughs> Rock fan. <laughs> Alton. <laughs> Don't put on the red light. That was the song. <laughs> See, that's what happened. When that's in play, that whole spiritual realm is in play. The guy is the weak, docile, feminine character, and the woman is the masculine character. Whoredoms is masculine. See, when you move and shake in that. It's always around you. It's like a thing that just always envelops you. You come in churches with that on you and you get victims in church, you'll know where they are in a church environment and you still try to practice your same old stuff in church because you know where the weak links are and the little lust for your little punk boys. So you'll sit through the service and ease out into the lobby. Praise the Lord. No, oh, man, go somewhere with all that. And I'm not trying to make nobody self-conscious. If you ain't like that, you ain't like that. So you don't care about what I just said. But if you like that, you just got found out. That's all that was. See, you got to be for real about what things bind you and get rid of them to make it in the kingdom of God. So you see now, this tension exists because in that world we came from an environment of usury. Men used the women, women used the men. Jezebel used 
Ahab, Ahab used Jezebel. What did Jezebel use Ahab for? Power. To ascend to the throne. I bind him and captivate him, I get the throne. What did Ahab use Jezebel for? Hmm? Pleasure. Power and pleasure. I can coochie-coo up under her. I can have all the whores I want. She's a temple prostitute. I can do whatever I want to do. I come home sulking. Looking all crazy. I ain't saying nothing, walking slow like pigeon toe, you know, walking in. To Jezebel says, What's wrong, Ahab? Neighbors. Neighbors. Hey, he won't let me have his vineyard. I asked him, I tried to buy it. He won't even let me have it. <laughs> Tell you the truth, I don't feel like even doing that. I don't even want to eat. <laughs> Stinking neighbors. I want this vineyard. I want to grow some grapes over there. But Jezebel says, Don't worry, Ahab. I will get the vineyard. That's all he wanted all along. He knew she'd do that. He used to say, man, a guy at your house talking about your hood and talking about that grass show is getting to hide there. Look at that. I got in the front window. Man, that grass, boy, that stuff needs to be cut. Mm hmm. Been a lot of rain recently. <laughs> Next thing you know, you out there cutting the grass. <laughs> you get through, you're a woman all sweaty and nasty, grungy, you know, all kinds of Bermuda grass all in your shoes and in your hair. Then you done got the trim and the trim, edge the lawn. Then got pet poop out the yard with a pooper scooper, bagged up all the lawn clippings, trimmed all the hedges. You come in the house, he got he's in a glass of lemonade thinking. You. Them cars show sure are nasty, they need to be washed. I'm on, I, so I get them, them cars got to get washed. Let's see him. Both of them called muddy and them tired, nasty. I'm let's see him. Let's, let's see him. Them cars sure will looking bad in that driveway. Look, look, they made the whole house look bad. They so nasty out there. All gone this sunny day, night day to wash them too. Hmm. Let's see him. Where is that bucket? I think that bucket out in the garage. You think? <laughs> You out there washing all the cord. The woman out there, on, she already nasty from cutting grass. You know, washed all the cord. Got tires shining all on them. Just, uh, you come back and I was wore out, about half dead. You know what? Uh, <laughs> 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 that shit, that's I uh, sure need to be unloaded, all that stuff in that shit. <laughs> I've been meaning for two weeks to take that stuff in the back of my truck to the landfill. Huh? No, uh, I'm just saying, I was trying to make you see. Listen what I'm telling you, Mallory. Mallory, listen. Uh, do you know what my wheelbarrow is? How you see my wheelbarrow? <laughs> Next thing you know, you got the wheelbarrow out there in that shit, unloading all that junk, taking it to the pickup truck. Yeah. You don't cut the grass, you don't wash the cars, you don't unload the shed, you don't load the truck at the landfill. Now you back at the house, they asking you, what for none <laughs> And you know, there's two baskets of clothes up there. You know what, I was gonna wash them clothes last night and I sure forgot it. He working you, he working you. But since you've been used to carrying the load like your mama taught you with a weak dude in tow, you've been trained to carry the load. So Ahab is working you. And Jezebel just want the power so she'll pay any price for the power. Because she called the shots at the house. But she got to keep under that heavy burden of being used by this trifling dude. 
And you can get programmed like that, man, to carry the load, carry the load. And God is trying to get you to stop carrying the load like a pack mule. The household of God is designed to refabricate everybody into proper order, and folks resist it. Why? Because like I was raised as a woman, I don't know how to be a woman. So guys that are guys, they offend me, and they make me afraid of them. And you really sealed up in fear. You're sealed up in that which is foreign to you, being something you can't even identify with. Fornication is what to a woman? It's her shield. What do you deal with? My body, not me. You put the body on the front burner out front for him to deal with, and you had sex just like a great Dane and another dog in the front yard. It's body-to-body -body contact. Ain't no soul and spirit involved. Ain't no inner court involvement. You could be married to somebody 20 years and never know them because you just had sex with them. But there's no intrusion into the inner court because you closed it off because you're afraid of anybody getting inside of you like that. So you put the body out front and you kept you back inside untouched and untampered with. So you had body-to-body -body sex, the lowest form of sex, erotic sex, eros. You, get, you make a friend out of the person, you get into phileo or he a brotherly friend. You get into agape, and you got the eternal spirit, the spirit love that's deep. You can have a physical or orgasm, you can have a soulish orgasm, or you can have a spiritual orgasm. And a spiritual orgasm takes you into another dimensional plane where you're enveloped into the person, and y'all become one flesh. That's scary to people, man, getting into somebody that deep. Because you know what'll happen? They can hurt you. That's why you don't, you don't let the shield down because you don't want to be hurt because you've been hurt before and the shields went up just like the shields on the Enterprise on Star Trek. <laughs> when the proton bombs were launched at the Enterprise, sh uh, Mr. Shields up! And you can walk around like that and you don't even know you like that. You got shields up. You unapproachable. You're unaccessible because you got shields up. Because you don't trust who? So therefore you don't trust Jesus because he's a man. You ain't going to never be deep into Jesus because you got shields up against him because Jesus is a man. He's a God man. So patriarchal, masculine figures, you keep a shield up. Oh, you a hugger, brother. Hey, brother, I'm glad the man that went on that weekend prayed the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hey, brother, say, pray the Lord. You in town. Pray the Lord. But no, you, you, I see you and running around like a chicken with your head cut off. <coughs> Let the shield down, man. Let the shield down. Let the shield down so the Lord can come in. Open wide ye gates, and the Lord of glory will come in. Who is the Lord of glory? You see, you got to let the shield down that you put up in sin because you dealt with dirty, selfish people that were using you. And after you got hurt that first time, you kind of built up a small shield. By that second or third time, boy, you had granite put up inside of you. And you'll get harder and harder as a woman. You ever seen a hard woman? She hard as nails. You know what, that is, what did that? That she got hurt a lot of times and it scabbed over, over and over again internally. Now she got that shield up like steel. And you know why they flee from this message? Because I preach inner court messages to get inside of you. See, right now I'm inside of you. You don't even know it. This is intercourse. This spiritual. Now see the heathens out there. You hear what he said? That joker, some kind of a rapist or something. You heard him? <laughs> Ain't nothing you can do with nobody that's just off, man. You just got to just let it go, man, and go ahead and deliver the message and get out of here. And see, when it gets too personal and God begins to go past the outer court into the inner court to get close into you where you really are hurting, where the wound really is, touch somebody with a wound on, a wound on, on the outside. And you touch them, that hurt, man. Don't touch, man, look, don't touch that, man. I just got cut right there, man. What you doing? 
But the Lord got to get to that wounded place, man, and it's going to be sensitive to the touch. And see, a lot of folk don't know they bear these wounds, but when he touch it, you're in a sensitive area. That's why you got to have a scalpel, not a machete in this. You got to use a scalpel. But sometimes the wounds run real deep. He said he came to do it. Heal up what? The wounded heart, the broken heart. He got he on the inside of you fixing stuff. And the word of God does. The word of God searches through you like a spotlight looking for the damaged areas so that you'll be able to hold who? The Holy Ghost. Look what he's saying, man. It's, everything in God is about the Holy Ghost. John chapter 14. Verse 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father that he shall send you what? Another comforter that he may abide with you forever. An eternal comforter that will be with you forever. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive. Think about that now. They can't receive him because he's true. If you told them a lie, they'd receive it. It's cause and effect. I can't receive the truth because I'm of the world still. Because it sees him not, neither knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world sees me no more, but you see me because I live. You shall live also. In that day you shall know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. So if I'm in him and he's in me and he's in the Father, therefore by proxy I'm in the Father. He that hath my commandments and keeps them, he it is that loves me. And he that loves me shall be loved of my Father and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. You want to manifest to Christ. That means I'll come show myself to you. It's a doxa. A doxa is a visitation that is tangible to your senses. He really came to see you. You want a visitation from God, not some type of a theoretical presentation of words. He says, I will manifest myself to you. Judah saith unto him, not a scary Lord, how is it that you will manifest thyself unto us and not unto the world? Jesus answered and said unto him, if a man love me, he will keep my words and my father will love him. And we will come unto him and make our abode, our home with him. He that loves me not keeps not my sayings, and the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you. But the who? The Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, in my authority, as my representative. He shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world gives, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. You have heard how I said unto you, I go away and come again unto you. If you loved me, you would rejoice because I said I go unto the Father, for my Father is greater than I. And now I have told you before it come to pass that when it is come to pass, you might believe. Hereafter I will not talk much with you, for the prince of this world comes and has what? Nothing, Nothing in me. But that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father gave me commandment, even so I do. Arise, let us go hence. So the prince of this dominion, this world, comes, and he got nothing to work with in me. That's what you're trying to get to. When the devil comes, he got no triggers. He got nothing to work with. I'm non-responsive because I want nothing from him, and I bring nothing to him. I have nothing that belongs to him. The devil just sifts through you to see what's in you that he has credence over. He got to find himself in you to operate with you. He's looking for hatred, malice, unforgiveness, judgmentalism, pride, ego, self-righteousness. Anything like himself, he'll exploit. 
So you're before God saying, God, expunge me, cleanse me, purify my heart. God, get my soul right. Get my, if there's anything I got against anybody, God, don't let anything come in to make me feel some kind of a way about somebody. Because I'm giving the devil what? An open door. I'm giving him carte blanche to exploit me. That's what you're defending yourself against, man. You got to be watchful not to let anything in that will give the devil an upper hand over you. That's why the, the devil keeps trying to do things to you to make you feel some kind of a way about somebody. And they do it all day long to me, man. They just, you're from hell. You're a false prophet. You're damnable. You're cursed. The God of heaven curse you. I hope a lightning bolt destroys you. I hope. So you can feel some kind of animosity. I don't, I look, I don't care enough to feel animosity about anything. All I tell people is, I hope the hell hole burns up tonight, the whole place. <laughs> I hope it burns to hell tonight. The whole, I, hope, I, hope, I hope atomic bombs hit the whole world tonight and just blow it up. Because they're fighting for, I don't even know what they're fighting for. What do you want from down here? This stink hole? That's the craziness. That's the insanity of a mind caught up in the devil's spirit thinking that another person can be a problem to them when God has already ordained Jesus Christ to be Lord of all. You have to worry about all this stuff, man. Nobody wants anything from here. It's time to move on. But what is, who does he send? He sends a comforter. So what happens to a guy? It's, it details it in Proverbs 6 and 7. Not willing to receive the Holy Ghost, I have to find a surrogate comforter. And a woman's body is built for what? Comfort. Comfort. I'm tired. I'm weary. I've been working all day. Calluses on my hand. And Ashley's body looked very comforting. She's built for comfort. I need comfort from her. So I'm divining on her to give me comfort. And you will feel that thing hit your mind in the grocery store. You walk by a guy. You see, Naima, she looks very comforting in that dress. I detect comfort. Look at her hair draped around over her ear. I hear one word in my mind when I see that. Comfort. And he trying to make her his Holy Ghost. See, I don't let Jesus pour the Holy Ghost on me to give me comfort, to give me solace for my soul. Notice what the harlot said in Proverbs chapter 7. Come and solace yourself. You know what that is? Comfort yourself. Come feel good in this bed. I got aloes and herbs and I sprinkled rose petals on it. That's like you, you got to try to seduce a guy. You got rose petals leading up the stairs to your room. Candles burning on every step of the stair. And you get to the top of the stairs, your drawers on the stairs at the top. <laughs> He thinking, he begins to get expecting about, <coughs> I open the door, you know what's behind that door? Comfort. Let me go into the chamber of comfort. That's what it's doing. And it's going to displace the Holy Ghost in his mind, and he becomes a headless horseman because Christ is the baptizer in the Holy Ghost. He says, I'm going to go away and go away and send you a comforter. If I disallow the Holy Ghost, guess who I just disallowed? The baptizer in the Holy Ghost. What has happened? Here's the mystery I'm trying to unfold to you today. A displaced comforter will lead you to what I'm about to show you right now by way of Revelation. Look at Revelation 17. This right here now You've got to know something about the Bible a little bit to understand what I'm about to say. Revelation 17, verse 1, And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great what? Whore that sits upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed what? Now listen to this next statement. 
and the inhabitants of the earth have been made what? With what? The wine of what? Check this. You got a whore with the kings of the earth fornicating. This produce some wine. And the folks are drinking the wine and it makes them what? Now remember this now. Get this now. A whore with the rulers of the earth are in intercourse together and is producing and manufacturing wine from the intercourse. Interactivity between the whore and the princes of this world. These are systemic representations of an intercourse that is involving systems. The whore is a system. It's religious. The kings of the earth are a political system. The whore rides the political system. The whore rides the beast, you'll find out. So you see now, that intercourse is going on. Look at this. And the wine produced makes people drunk. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of who? Harlots, which is interpreted also prostitutes and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. The cup she had was full of the blood of saints and martyrs. And she drinking down blood from all the folks she killing who represented Jesus while fornicating with this beast system. Now, there's two ways to ride this beast. You can ride it like a cowboy riding a horse or you can ride it like a woman having sex with the man laying on his back and she's riding the beast. Now, he just said she was fornicating with the beast. So I opt for the latter representation of riding the beast. You can take it any way you want to, but I'm trying to show you something. I don't think she's galloping in like no horse fornicating. Probably, see, that's what I'm saying. You see, you see how yet? That joker is... This ain't God. This ain't nothing but pornography. No, it ain't, man. I'm trying to show you, man, what's going on. He just said she was fornicating with the beast. What has happened? Adam has now transformed into the governmental systems of the world, and Eve has become the religious systems. Eve is dominating Adam, full of the devil's spirit. When Eve stood before Adam, she was a life type of another kind. She had gone through transformation, transformational mutation. She was full of the devil. He looked in her eyes for the first time, and Satan's slanted eyes looked back at him with that slit of a serpent in her eyes. She had never, he had never been exposed to this before, as now she's divining witchcraft on the boy and about to knock him over. And he dominated, she dominated him to the degree he forsook God. He decapitated himself and cut off Jesus at his head. So when Jesus came around, he was foreign to him now. And he hid himself from him. Walk with him every day. Familiar friend, best buddy, the God of all creation. I love him to death. And now interacting with this whore, castrating him. I'm hiding myself from him. Just like folk will slither out of here when they decapitated. They can't walk with the brethren. They can't come to a man up meeting because I'm slithering in darkness with Eve having decapitated me and castrated me. And I become the enemy of all you brethren. That's how it works. The whore rides the beast, intercourse, drunk with the wine, and now I think I'm a prophet of God and I'm a prophet of the Jezebelian system. What made him like that? The wine of the fornication made him drunk. You got to get this, man. If you don't get nothing else, get what I'm about to tell you right here today and leave here different. Mark chapter 2. 
So this ain't stuff to land on the surface in the Bible. This got to be mined up out of the Bible, what I'm telling you today. Mark chapter 2, verse 18. And the disciples of John and of the Pharisees used to fast, and they come and say unto him, Why do the disciples of John and of the Pharisees fast, but thy disciples fast not? Talking to Jesus. And Jesus said unto them, Can the children of the bride chamber fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them, and then shall they fast in those days. Why, why, why? I'm going to show you why. No man also sews a piece of new cloth on an old garment, else the new piece that filled it up takes away from the old, and the rent is made worse. And no man puts what? Into an old bottle. Else the new wine doth burst the bottles, and the wine is spilled, and the bottles be marred. But new wine must be put into what? Some of y'all got the translations that say wine skins. Wine skins are made of like um, uh, leather from, from, a, from a cow or beef or whatever. It's, and it, it gets brittle over time and gets hard. So when it gets old, if you put wine, it'll crack because it's brittle from being old. So you got to get a soft, pliable wine skin. It's the skin of an animal to put new wine in because it's fermenting still, and it releases what? Gases through fermentation. So it's expanding the wine skin, and the wine skin must be pliable enough to expand with the fermenting wine inside. It's a type of who? The Holy Ghost. Correct? Now. Now we got the stage set to give you the revelation I'm after. The harlot fornicating with the beast produces what? Jesus is pouring out both systems release wine. Both systems release wine. It's the wine of Christ or it's the wine of the whore. What the whore is to the devil's economy, Christ is to God's economy. Look at this. The wine of Christ is the Holy Ghost. The wine of the devil is the unholy ghost. You've been baptized by a spirit, but what spirit are you of? Guess what? The old hose vessel will hold the old wine. But the new wine can only go into a new vessel. That's the missing link between people. They love the world. They dried up and they stalled out and arrested in the old man. And the devil fills the old man with counterfeit wine. They're full of counterfeit wine. They got churches everywhere. And folk think they got God and the Holy Ghost. And it's the wine of this whore that's riding this beast. What produces the wine? According to the Bible, huh? The fornication, with the fornication with the harlot. What produces it with Jesus? Spiritual intercourse. Get the picture now. Get the picture. We go to an upper room. We lock away and we pray and fast and seek the Lord. And what pours out? New wine. Why? Because we conducted intercourse in the upper room. And Jesus responded by pouring out the wine into sanctified vessels. My people will not fast while I'm here. But when I'm gone, they're going to conduct intercourse with me as the bride of Christ, and I'm going to respond by pouring out new wine to offset the wine that comes from this whore riding this beast. A whore's wine goes into a whore's vessel. And guess what kind of vessel it's got to be? A sodomite vessel. It's got to be standing on his head with the matriarchal systems in authority with men submitted to it. 
and he pouring that wine out, man, by the gallons right now. You step out from under that system and come to Christ, and he makes you into a man of God or a woman of God, you become a candidate for new wine. And when you hunger and thirst after righteousness, verily, you shall be filled. Sal cried out yesterday in prayer for the baptism in the Holy Ghost. We went from that service to water baptism. Follow the design in the Bible. Look at Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. Verse 38, what does he say? Then Peter said unto them, repent and be what? Baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. I think Baines read this yesterday. And you shall receive who? The gift of the Holy Ghost. Then look what he says. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. What's the next phase in Sal's transition over to receiving the fullness of the Holy Ghost? Jesus said, if you draw nigh unto me, I will draw nigh unto you. All he got to do now is sanctify himself in fasting and prayer, and the Holy Ghost will come just as sure as I'm standing here. Because he's going to see a vessel, what? Complete, separated, and fit for the master to use him. He obeyed what he said. Repent. Believe, be baptized, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. What's he pitted himself against? That old wine of that harlot fornicating with these systems out here. It's all on TV, all over the internet, all in religious systems, all in church. Roman Catholicism is a complete example of it, man. Praying to Mary, a statue of a woman. Carrying little Tammuz, a resurrected Nimrod. Pretending that's Jesus, matronizing all these guys to believe that feminine character is God and an intercessor for them. And the Holy Ghost is shut off from it because it's not revealing the Father. You got to align yourself with Jesus, the Son, and the Father, and the baptizer in the Holy Ghost and fire is going to fall on you. When you least expect it, at night when you're sleeping, in the shower, he can come at his discretion. Somewhere installing tile. Somewhere picking up wood to put in the back of his truck. And all of a sudden, suddenly, the sound of a mighty wind came in. And he sat upon them as tongues of fire. Knocked them off of the back of that pickup truck and ro rolled them down a grassy knoll. <laughs> man, don't fool around with God, man. The woman is riding the beast trying to get you to receive wine that makes you drunk. The wine of the harlot makes you drunk. The wine of Jesus makes you sober. You'll have a sober mind. And they in the flesh, when they saw him full of the Holy Ghost talking in tongues, said they were drunk because they were the antithesis of the wine they drank. They were the drunk ones, drunk with the wine of the fornication of the harlot and the beast. I just sobered up, man. That's why I'm talking in tongues. I'm as sober as can be. And you call me drunk because you're drunk. They turned the world upside down. What's negative to the devil is positive to God. What's positive with the, with the devil is negative with God. He's turning the world right side up, and they perceived it to be turned upside down. Just follow the pattern, man. It's laid out. Repent. Be baptized. And then you got to have one thing in you to seal the deal. Expectancy. Yes. I expect to be filled. Yes. I met the qualifications. I present myself. Yes. Holy and acceptable unto God, this is my reason for service. I present my body. Yes. I expect to be filled. Yes. I obey. Yes. I expect you to fulfill your word. Yes. That's how you got to be, man. Yes. Doubting nothing. 
is a whore that became the Holy Ghost. She rolled that beast and poured that fake wine in the guy's souls. Looking for comfort that the Holy Ghost was supposed to be. I opted to find my comfort between the legs of a whore. And now I'm laid up somewhere looking crazy. Castrated, emaciated, and made into a eunuch. That's why I'm trying to hit off young boy like Nick. Nick, I keep on picking on him because I've been down that road and most of these older guys been down that road. They lost their balls out there in the jungle fooling around with Jane. <laughs> thinking I'm Tarzan. I'm out there with Jane and she got my balls and her and Cheetah swinging away. <laughs> it was a knapsack with my balls and a Cheetah yelling, Swinging through the jungle. Here I am laid up in the hut in the tree, in the tree house. Crazy. All the older guys been where he going. Them little old girls ain't doing nothing new, man. They trying to build you up with your ego, making you think you the man, because they got that machete. And as, long, as soon as you lay down with one of them, they're going to hack your balls off, hack your gonads off. And you're going to come out different, weak and emaciated, can't be a man, sensitive, emotional, easily offended, angry at every guy that challenges you to man up. What do you think is wrong with Antonio Brown? What do you think is wrong with Odell Odom? O what's his name, Odell? Beckham. Odell Beckham. What do you think is wrong with them? Why do you think Antonio Brown dry, uh, uh, dyes his mustache blonde? Odell Beckham dyes his hair blonde, running around, can never fit into the team, never a team player, because they can't amalgamate into men. They can't be part of a band of brethren. They can't take being coached by a disciplinarian, because they didn't have a daddy to raise them correctly. Right now, Antonio Brown is standing against his daddy right now, talking about his daddy ain't nothing. Because the daddy called him out for not being able to sustain himself on the team like he should. This thing is a deadly game. Say so y'all be good, man. We'll see y'all later. Say right. so Enrique. We'll see y'all next time, man. I'm telling you, this the hand we've been dealt. It's all about the Holy Ghost. Don't make it about anything else. The Holy Ghost is the revelator of Christ. He's the showbread. The Holy Ghost is the candlestick. You're seeking to be filled with the Holy Ghost to expand the revelation of Jesus. In the vessel, just like fermenting wine, he expands. You got to be what? Pliable. You got to be pliable. Don't get stoically set in a self-righteous mode thinking you've arrived and you got it. You can't get it down here. Remain pliable. Let him shape you. Let him mold you. Be quick to repent, quick to change, because he's shaping you, molding you to hold what? More wine. With every advancement, you're going to get more wine, man, until you're filled. He said be filled with the Holy Ghost. I'm telling you, that whore is riding that beast. That whore is trying to baptize you in a pseudo Holy Ghost to displace the real one. It will make you believe you got it, and then he'll use the validation of feminine character to sign off on your identity. And you'll be thinking you're a man because Jezebel told you you're one. And Christ knows nothing about you. Zero. And you'll walk around drunk as a skunk, thinking you're a prophetic voice of God. And it's nothing but a false prophet that Jezebel set up. Don't you realize when she got, away, got rid of the real prophets, the first thing she did was establish false ones? Prophets of the Grove and prophets of Baal. And they were thinking they were authenticated prophets sitting up with Jezebel prophesying all day long under the inspiration of the devil and the Antichrist spirit. I'm telling you, man, make your calling an election sure, make it your thing. They came, they repented, they got baptized. The next scheduled thing to happen to you in God's economy is the infilling of the Holy Ghost. Don't let anybody deter you away from it. Amen. This promise is for you and your children. And as many as that are far off, 
even to as many as the Lord your God shall call. Don't believe anything else. Believe that. See, let your mind narrow down. I read this to you, Acts 2, 38 and 39. All right, that settles it. I read it for myself. It's systematic. It's progression. You just got to obey and believe it and expect the Holy Ghost to come on you. I'm going to seek. I'm going to ask. I'm going to knock. Verily, I got to be filled. If I draw nigh to you, God, I fervently approach the throne, then you got to feel me because you said you're going to draw nigh to me. He's a baptizer in the Holy Ghost and fire. And he's going to thoroughly purge his threshing floor. Everything unclean and things that are not like him will be dismissed all by themselves. The anger of the Sodomite kingdom will turn on you because you stepped outside of it. Expect it. Embrace it and like it. Because they hate God. They're God haters. And they despise the spirit of grace and the spirit of truth. They hate God's Holy Ghost. Can't nobody take anything away from you. If Mallory knows she got baptized in the Holy Ghost, you will be a fool to try to make her believe she didn't. Oh, you didn't get the Holy Ghost. Whatever happened to you, that was just make believe. That was in your mind. And you probably got excited or whatever, but you'll be a fool, man. Because most folk know the day, the time, and the hour the Holy Ghost came upon them. And if you don't have the Holy Ghost, it's something missing in your experience. And you kind of like a nomad in the midst of all the church folk trying to figure it out with your own mind. But boy, when the Holy Ghost comes on you, all of a sudden you get this peace that surpasses all understanding. And you get lifted away from here. And you get in a, in a realm where you keep seeking God, you'll get more and more full. And your mind will transcend time and space. And all you're going to get is people chirping away at your ankles, trying to get you not to, not to ascend. Don't ascend. Pay attention to us. Listen to us. No, man. I'm trying to live the high life. I'm setting my affections on things above, not the earth. I could care less about this place. Your problems are just that, your problems, because I ain't got no problems. <laughs> Don't call me with your problems, because I ain't got no problems. And if you keep calling me, the only problem I'm going to have is you calling me. Because <laughs> whomsoever will, they can come and drink of the waters that are freely given. You folks like Marvin here and Bridget, they sit right there at World Changes. For how long were y'all over there? 25 years. Something wasn't fulfilled. Something wasn't coming together. Something wasn't clicking. You don't get a massive exodus from there. Why? They're used to the old wine. The only reason they walk out of there because they're looking for something more. It's got to be more to God than this. I'm not getting the nourishment I need. I'm looking for something more. I'm looking for a deeper depth, a higher height. I'm looking for something is missing in me. That's the kind of people God looking for. People that will search him out, that will pursue him, who want to draw, not, draw nigh to him so that he can draw nigh to them. That's what it's all about, folks. If you don't do that, all you're going to find yourself doing is finding yourself a whore that will become your Holy Ghost. And you'll pretend I'm living the high life and I'm spiritual. But deep down in your unsanctified soul, you know you got a wilderness and a wasteland inside of you. And what's going to give you away is the vitriol, the hatred, the venom, the, the, the malice that comes out of your mouth all day long. Because you got a bitter pool in you. There's an old Derek Prince book called Life's Bitter Pool. Get a copy if you get a chance. A root of bitterness can spring up in you. And you on the internet to defile many, because many will be defiled from your bitterness inside of you. That's why I'm telling you to guard your heart, because out of it flows the issues of life. Don't seal up inside of yourself. Open up and let God expunge everything that's vile, everything that's nasty, all the putrefying stuff inside of us. Man, just let him take it out of you. 
Open yourself up. Say, God, whatever you got to do to remove every vestige of the world, the flesh, and the devil from my soul, do it. I'm tired of being guarded. I'm tired of walking around with a shield up inside of me. And behind this shield, I'm throwing darts, trying to undermine and do somebody else in. I'm tired of this. I'm tired of living a life of just poverty and lack and discord and hatred and bitterness and malice. And I'm tired of this. I want to live the high life. I want to see your kingdom come inside of me. If you hunger and thirst after righteousness, verily, most assuredly, you shall be filled. If you will, stand to your feet, please. If the devil's got your mind, everything God just said is negative. That's crazy, isn't it? The devil can have your mind so set in bitterness, torment, and hatred that you can't even hear the truth if somebody sit up before you on a silver platter because my own bitterness and my own heart is defiling me. There is nothing from without a man that can defile a man. Every defiling element is on the inside. You got to stay focused on Jesus Christ through his word. Meditate therein day and night. We preach revelation of the Bible, not letter. If you are in the right place at the right time with your mind having meditated on the word of God, everything God just said is easily entreated. You see it just like that. Now your mind will know. That's true right there. That's right right there. And nobody can even argue with you. You'll know it right instinctively. Or you'll know it's wrong if it's wrong. Because you spent time with the source of truth, Jesus himself. And you'll know what's true and what's not, what's him and what's not. It's all about spending time with the source to be able to hear everything the source comes to you with to enlighten you and enhance your spiritual life. It's time, man, to cross over to a realm where all these clamoring mouths and crazy people and warped minds are cast aside to have Jesus come to us and manifest himself like he promised and show us his salvation. He and the Father must come to us and make their abode in us for us to live in this new living way of life. It's time for change, man. It's time for drastic change, dramatic change in these last days. Father God, we thank you for this time of sharing. We ask you right now, God, to endow those to the seeking the Holy Ghost with power from on high. We ask you, God, for a divine visitation and that your spirit will move in a supernatural way to actually lift people out of this pitiful, God-forsaken wasteland to receive the fullness of the Godhead in bodily form. I believe the Holy Ghost houses everything we need. I believe the nameless servant that went forth to find Rebekah, sent forth from Abraham and Isaac, had everything Rebekah needed to make it back home. I believe the Holy Ghost is the administrator. He is the earnest, the down payment of our salvation. I believe the Holy Ghost is your gift to us to make sure we make it in. We got to stay with him. We got to let him feel us. He's got to enlighten us. He's got to inspire us. He's got to anoint us. The Bible says the same anointing that we have received will teach us that we have no need that anyone teach us for the Holy Ghost will well up in us to teach us and lead us and guide us into all truth. God, in the name of Jesus, in a volatile world, in a world gone mad, with apostasy, Breaking out all around us. People going to Hebrew Israelitism. People going to all kinds of foreign religions. People believe they got some kind of word from God and it's just a delusion. Folk becoming body idolaters. They worship their own bodies. Lost and crazy and going insane. The only one that can give us stability is the Holy Ghost of God. God, the Holy Ghost got to come upon us. Everybody that's seeking, they've been asking, they've been fasting and praying and knocking at the door of heaven. God, come on. Why not me? Baptize me. Feel me. I want to do right. I want to live right. 
I don't want to be nothing like I used to be. I need to transcend everything I was. I want to be filled with the Holy Ghost. I'm praying and interceding, God, that the Holy Ghost fall on us and fill us in Jesus' name. If you would, raise your hands while you are and pray this prayer. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, if I got the Holy Ghost, I need more of the Holy Ghost. If I don't have the Holy Ghost, I need the Holy Ghost. God, in the name of Jesus, have mercy on my soul and pour out your spirit like you said you would. You said in the latter days, I poured out my spirit on all flesh. You'll dream dreams. You'll have visions. You'll prophesy. Doors will open to you. Revelation will be made to you. A visitation will come to you. I'm asking you, God. Come on. Pour out the Holy Ghost. In Jesus' name. I receive it. That you be glorified. In these last days. Make me a witness to the nations. Amen. Father, right now I pray that the Holy Ghost come upon these present and those by way of the internet. That the power of God shall overshadow them like you did with Mary. And that the power will come upon these people that have presented themselves to you, God, to move on to another place in God. Let the anointing of God rest upon them and make them willing vessels fit for you to use. Manifest the nature and the fruit out of them and endow them with the gifts of the Spirit to be a witness. It's time to move over to demonstrated power. We need the gifts and the callings of God that are given without repentance to operate in us. In Jesus' name. This is real. This is real, God. We got to have it now. This thing is desperation calling. Deep is calling unto deep. Insanity is set in the people's mind. They're going crazy. They're drunk with the fornication of that harlot. And they're losing their minds. And God, we need stability. We need an anchor. We need to see this thing poured out for real in a tangible way. Too much. It's too much going on. It's too much in Jesus' name. Before we go, anybody here not saved, anybody here not giving your, your life to the Lord yet, these are the last of the last days. Folks about to go to hell by the millions. And I can't afford to be left off of this trip out of here because it's the last trip leaving, the last load leaving earth. Anybody here not saved that wants to be saved, you raise your hand, come up front. We'll pray for you to receive the Lord as your Savior. Anybody not here say, that's not saved. If you know you're not saved, don't be fooling around with it. Don't be pretending like you're saved, trying to look like you want to fit in, man. This thing is almost over. It's almost over. We're not going to get too many more opportunities to give our life to the Lord. From the last train leaving the station, I got to make this one, buddy, because there ain't no, another one coming through here. After the day, we shutting the station down. That's the desperation of the time we live in. You got to want to be born again now. Baptized and filled with the Holy Ghost. For real. In Jesus' name. Anybody else here, not, you know you're not saved. Nobody knows you're not saved like you. Don't pretend. You know when you pass from death unto life. And the spirit bears witness that you got born again. The spirit will bear witness in the inner man. There's a lot of attacks that come on people who've been born again because, hey, the spirit is bearing witness in you and the people know the spirit bears witness through you. So they hate you. But it's the way it is. There's always somebody right and somebody's wrong. And God will bear witness to what's right because he'll save people through you and you'll produce after your own kind to show forth that you're born again because you produce other born again folks. That's how it works. 
Hypocrites and liars never save anybody because they're just stuck on stupid in this world. Anybody else? Right now, pray this prayer with me. Say, Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, raise your hand. Lord, I come before you a sinner needing salvation. Right now, I'm asking you to save my soul. I bring nothing worth anything before the throne of God, but I bring myself volunteering for your service. God, I accept Jesus as my personal Savior. I acknowledge him as creator of all. I bow the knee before him and ask you, Jesus Christ, to come into my life and save me, a sinner from certain damnation. Lord, have mercy on my soul. Forgive my sins and cleanse me from everything I've done. In Jesus' name, I receive the finished work on the cross as my only way of being accepted. It's not by works. It's by faith in what you did 2,000 years ago. I put all my trust in what you did for me. And I allow you to change me any way you see fit. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Right now, God, I pray for him right now, God, to receive the Holy Ghost and power to live this life. I curse every demonic element that's tried to bind this life in the name of Jesus. I curse the devil. I curse that realm of hip-hop, drugs, fornication, and every divined up witchcraft working spirit that's trying to stop him. All seduction, all the horror spirits, all the powers of hell that have been forecasted against this life. I render you powerless in Jesus' name. As for resurrection power to overshadow him and stir him alive in Jesus' name and break the bands of wickedness in Jesus' name. Do it for your glory. Do it for your honor. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Oh, yeah, man. Yeah. That's what we here here for. We here for the young fellows. It's time for the young guy to come in out the rain, you know. Folk mad and angry and cursing you and spitting in your face when you're just trying to bring in this harvest of these last few people. Young guys, young women who don't have a chance in this arena they live in unless somebody steps up to the plate and volunteers for service. That's what it's all about. It's going to wrap up another man up meeting y'all. The women's turn come up in March. Looking to actually let the women come into another realm of revelation, moving on down the road. Sanctify yourself for the next three months, fasting and prayer, man, and get ready for March. It's time, man, for another manifestation of the kingdom of God on this planet as a revival takes hold of humanity. And God raises up some folk that mean business. It's time for a new breed of people. A new world order has to be accosted by a new church order. Reformation of the church under proper leadership and authority to do the works of God. That cursed Jezebel spirit and Ahab coalition, it runs amok, crazy and insane. But they're not saving anybody. You don't save people by trying to curse folk and stop people from getting the salvation. You don't care nothing about the babes in Christ. You don't care nothing about people being born again because you're trying to prevent salvation. And to prevent salvation is to, pre is to prevent Christ and the Holy Ghost trains on you. Because it's better to put a millstone around your neck and be cast into the sea than to try to hinder one of these little ones from getting to Christ. That's a serious situation. So to next year, y'all, all the guys that's visiting, I hope you have a safe trip back. Everything goes well in your life. Ask God to have you prosper even as your soul prospers. And that you move forward hyper-driven by the power of God to do his will. Don't bow down 
Don't draw back. Don't let the magic of this world enthrall you. Don't let these harlots divine don't you. And whatever you do, stay out of the devil's matrix. Support Dunamis Tabernacle, www.omegaministry.org. Click on support, then donate. Love everybody by, by people, by, by way of the internet, all the people that live stream and Facebook Live. Everybody here want to see you do good, make it prosper, advance in God, and not be set aside and held back by anything. Move forward. Get out of here and let God use you in supernatural ways. Be blessed. See you next time. Have a good week.